Okay, three, two, one. Hello world! Hi! Today is the 10th of April and it's exactly 10 o'clock, at least Italian time. Uh, the weather is nice, but going to be wasted. Uh, it, it will get worse very soon. I see the sun, but I also see very dark clouds. So hopefully my connection and my uh, electric current will continue for four hours straight. But if not, I apologize in advance and uh, I'll probably have to end the stream sooner. But maybe not. Probably not. I don't know. Let's see. So, did you spend a good Easter holidays? I saw many people uh, missing the lessons and that's fine. That's why I wanted to slow down and not continue with the program. Instead, we did uh, other things. For example, we had this uh, Bob Ross moment in which I created the Certificate of Survival. And um, I'm really happy with the results and I'm really happy that I will be able to, uh, to provide this certificate of survival to you guys. So as soon as the academy is over, or maybe even before that, I don't know, I will probably create different certificates for every uh, of my most l loyal watchers and those who interacted more, those who uh, did their exercises and shared more of their exercises in public or in private with me, that's fine. And uh, you will have the certificate of survival and it will be a PDF, it will be digitally signed by me, so it will be authentic. And you can, I don't know, you can put it on LinkedIn if, uh, if it creates any worth to you. Or you can print it or you can do whatever you want with it, let's see. Uh, but now we're going to look at uh, new topics. Are you ready for fresh new topics? Is everything fine for you? Hope so. Okay, so JavaScript, inheritance. We started looking at inheritance last, well, two Saturdays ago. And um, we didn't finish. Uh, it's a topic that I don't really care too much about and you will see why. Um, in JavaScript, we always had a kind of inheritance that I never saw in any other language and it's called prototypal or prototypical inheritance. This is a kind of inheritance that is actually pretty difficult to grasp. It's, di it's different from other kinds of inheritances that you have in other languages and that's why nowadays nobody uses prototypal inheritance. Instead, the JavaScript language, starting from ES6 I think, uh, introduced the concept of classes, which is a concept that we programmers know really well because they started with uh, languages such as C++, which is C with the addition of classes and other cool uh, goodies, other sugar syntaxes on top of C. And uh, we now use a lot of classes in uh, statically typed languages such as Java, C Sharp, etc, etc. Lots of uh, languages nowadays feature classes. PHP started introducing classes from version 5, I think. Uh, Python has classes, Ruby has classes, uh, I think Go has classes too, I don't know. Uh, almost every language has classes. Why is that? Is it because they are so important? Probably not. It's because every language is now trying to uh, give you the tools that you want. That's it. So if you start with a, uh, with a functional programming language, at a certain point in the life of that programming language, it will start featuring classes, because if you like classes, then you should be able to use classes. And even class-based languages, such as Java or C Sharp, started introducing concepts based on functional programming languages because if you want to do some program, some functional programming, then you should be allowed to do it. So there's some sort of convergence between those languages. Uh, languages are usually different, but they are also very, very similar. Most of the languages that we know are C-based languages. So they are languages that 
were based on top of C. They spawn from C and they have a syntax similar to C, but they have additions and simplifications and new features and new constructs uh, that C, uh, plain C doesn't have. Um, JavaScript introduces classes, which doesn't mean that you should use classes. In fact, there are many technologies, JavaScript technologies out there that do not use classes at all. Uh, when I started writing JavaScript code and I stopped writing Java, C Sharp and other languages code, I completely stopped using classes because I don't need them. There are some technologies that rely on classes and I try to stay away from, the, from those technologies. Uh, you will see why. I will give you uh, some sneak peeks on why classes are not that relevant anymore, at least in my opinion and in the opinion of many other people out there. Classes are a way to build objects that share the same type. So they share the same kind of state and they share the same behavior because classes, just like plain objects, feature methods. And you can define an object that belongs to a class, so an object that is an instance of a class, which can hold its own data and it can also um, invoke its own methods, which are usually common among different objects of the same class. So it's very similar to other, conce uh, other concepts that we saw together, like, um, uh, well, the, uh, how was that? The factory function. The factory function was just a function that created objects of the same kind. And oh, starting from the factory function, we also saw the constructor function, which was very, very similar, but it's uh, part of the JavaScript language. And now we've got classes, which are... Uh, very easy to grasp, actually, if you understood everything that we saw so far. So this is a factory function. It's a function that, given some parameters, will create an object. Uh, it will fill this object with some properties and then will return the object as it is. And that's, uh, that's just a function. We are calling it a factory function because we like the name and that's it because it's a function that just like a factory produces objects in this of the same kind um, well with, with which have the same shape at least and then we've got the constructor function which actually is part of the javascript language it's a special function it usually starts with a capital letter um, and it has an implicit this so you don't need to create the user object and attach things to it because the this object is the object that you are building and you can attach properties to this and at the end of this constructor function the this is automatically returned to you so you don't even need to return this because it's already hey Tiago hi nice to see you I was worried that nobody was watching me right now sorry I'm late no worries no worries I'm um, actually rehearsing a little bit what, what is happening with classes. So uh, we were looking at factory functions, we're looking at constructor functions, and then we are now, um, we are now at the topic of, hey, Angelo, me too, good morning, hi. No worries, no worries. It's, uh, it's, it's Saturday and it's spring, so I can, I, I can understand pretty well uh, some lateness. Um, so, a class is just a fancy way to create constructor functions. Well, not only, um, but classes were, s before being defined in the JavaScript languages, uh, in the JavaScript language, you could somehow define a class in a clever way, which was using prototypical inheritance. Now, classes are based on prototypical inheritance, but you can just use them as they are. Class person. Class person has a method, a special method called constructor, which is very similar to the constructor function that you see here. The only difference is that it's called constructor and not user or a person. So constructor takes any number of parameters you want to pass. You can even perform operations on those parameters and then you just assign uh, anything you want to the this variable. The constructor is a function that initializes the object that you are going to instantiate. 
So that's why it's called a constructor, because it constructs, it, 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 uh, it gives you the footprint on how to construct a new object. The person can also have methods, and methods are written like this. And I think that we already saw this kind of syntax in plain objects. In fact, this kind of syntax in plain objects was actually a sugar syntax inherited from how we usually define uh, methods in classes. So get age with no function, not function, with no function, no arrow functions. You can, but it's probably better not. So you just have the method get age and then you do whatever you want. This in particular is called usually a getter method because it's a method that just gets the value of a property. Why is it important? Well, it's not always important, but usually in other, ling in other languages, sorry guys, in other languages, uh, properties are somehow hidden to you unless you want to expose them. Uh, in other languages, there is this concept called private properties. So the properties are kept private, hidden. You cannot access those properties from outside of the object. And the getter method is a method that allows you to expose the property and also maybe change the property before exposing it if you want to. And this is exactly what we did here because classes actually um, also feature another a uh, cool thing which is called uh, extending inheritance and uh, when I declare a class or that is called woman which extends person this class inherits everything that a person does but I can override some behavior or even some properties for example in this case the getter method get age of woman is going to override the default behavior and it's going to not just return the age but it will return the result of this ternary prayer. If the age is greater than 25, then just return 25. Otherwise, invoke the getAge method of the parent class, of the super class, okay? The base class, we say sometimes. So that's what we did last time. And that's almost everything that you need to know about classes, at least for now. Classes are a way to describe how objects of the same kind should be constructed. You usually define uh, properties, you define a constructor that allows you to create a class, uh, an object with a specific initialization logic. You also provide methods that are able to perform things on objects of the same kind and you have inheritance. Why is it so not important? Well, the reason why I don't like uh, the concept of classes, and I used to love the concept of classes, is that classes uh, allow you to do a new kind of programming. Not new. <laughs> it's new for us because we're doing this academy, but it's actually pretty old. It started in early 90s, probably, or even before that. Uh, yeah, I think that Java was created in uh, 1993 or 1995, so it's uh, quite an old concept nowadays, even though it's, it feels like yesterday to me. Uh, but classes allow you to do a new programming paradigm, which is called object-oriented programming. And object-oriented programming is very, very cool as a concept at least on paper. In reality, I, I didn't, I, I don't know, I, I, I grew up not that fond of object-oriented programming anymore. Uh, okay, I can see some images here that say that the concepts behind OOP are classes, yes. Encapsulation, which is a fancy word that means hiding information. So it's very similar to when you hide information inside of a function because the function doesn't expose anything that you don't want to expose. Abstraction is another important concept because you are trying to model the, uh, the problem at hand through the definition of classes. So you are abstracting uh, the problem in the 
world of the matrix. Uh, you have the concept of objects, of course, because objects are instances of classes. Objects are those building blocks that interact with each other, and usually they are defined through classes. A class is just a, fo a footprint from which you derive the creation of objects. And you've got inheritance, which, as we saw, it's uh, classes extending other classes. And we also got this fancy word called polymorphism, which means that uh, an object can have, let's say, multiple shapes. It has, well, polymorphism actually means this. Poly, in Greek, means multiple. Morph, uh, well, it, it, it looks like English. Morph, in Greek, is uh, uh, a form, yeah, shape. So it, uh, when an object has multiple shapes, it can... Uh, so it, it can behave in different ways according to the shape that it has. Polymorphism is one of those concepts that we can use in JavaScript, but actually real object-oriented programming also needs static typing. It also needs a different kind of concept, which is called interfaces. And uh, recently they added other things like generics, so all these other concepts are not part of the JavaScript language. This means that, at least from my point of view, I think that you cannot do real objects-oriented programming the classical way in plain JavaScript. And you need to use a different kind of language, maybe TypeScript. TypeScript, I already mentioned it multiple times. It's uh, a language that is a superset of JavaScript. It means that it's JavaScript, but it adds things. And as soon as you compile or transpile this TypeScript, those things that were added will be just scraped off. And you're left with just plain JavaScript. So TypeScript is not a completely different language. It was created by Microsoft, and it's now maintained by Microsoft, I think. Yeah, pretty sure. Yeah, Microsoft. Uh, but there's interest uh, from other companies like Google. Google is using TypeScript in their framework called Angular. Which is a framework that I don't like. And nowadays, many people are starting to dislike it and favor instead other frameworks like React or Vue.js or Svelte. Uh, this is another recent framework. Uh, but React is probably the main one. So, with TypeScript, you can really do object-oriented programming because you have everything that you need. You have classes, which, are, uh, which spawn from JavaScript, but you also have static typing, you also have interfaces, you have generics, and so you can do real object-oriented programming. What is this object-oriented programming? I didn't tell you. So, it's a programming paradigm. Uh, a paradigm is... Um, I, I don't know how to say it. It's uh, a way to solve problems with coding, of course. We are looking at a procedural paradigm in JavaScript, which means that we are um, writing procedures. We are instructing the computer on what the computer should do. And we are also probably doing some imperative programming, because every, uh, every function that we do is actually uh, commanding the computer to do something. That's why it's imperative, i.e. I'm imperating you, computer, to do this and this and that. Uh, there's not only this, there's also declarative programming. HTML and CSS are more declarative as a programming language. Some people even say that it's not a real programming language. In a declarative programming language, you just declare, you define what the solution should look like. So in HTML, you don't say, hey, add this thing to the body, add this paragraph, now change the color of this heading to blue. You don't say this in imperative. You say, hey, the body should have the H1, the H1 should have a color of blue, and there should be a paragraph, etc., etc. So this is more declarative, because we are declaring what the solution should be like. In JavaScript, we started to do also some little bit of functional programming. Functional programming is 
programming through the use of functions. And you can do whatever you want with functions. Uh, you can pass them as parameters in other functions. You can compose those functions together. You can curry the functions. You can do exactly what you want. And even though the functions, as we already saw and, and said, are very imperative as a, a concept, functional programming sometimes allows you to write code in a very declarative way, actually. In fact, the last thing that we did uh, with function composition, for example, well, no, not function composition because you were not all there. So let's go to, uh, what was that? Array methods, okay? When we started doing array methods, we said something like, hey, I can filter all the even numbers and then square those even numbers and then sum them all. And I can do this with array methods. And this, even though it uses functions, becomes more declarative than not using array methods. In fact, when I look at this, I say, hey, the array should filter the numbers that it has given the property of being even. And then I want the every item to be the square of itself. And then I want to reduce all the elements to the sum of their elements. So as you can see, this is a little more declarative than doing something like this instead, in which I say, hey, initialize the sum to zero, then iterate over all the items of the array, then uh, calculate the square of the current item. Then, if the item is even, then sum, uh, increase the sum with the squared item, and blah, 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 blah. So, this is very imperative. I'm, I'm instructing the computer to do exactly, step by step, what the computer should do. But with this, not only it's very short, but this is just, hey, you take the array, you filter it by even, you map squares and reduce to the sum. So very concise and it's also very declarative. I know that the result should be uh, the reduction to a sum of the squares of even numbers from an initial array. I hope it makes sense. So functional programming is also a way to make things more declarative. And we also have other paradigms. There's a language called Prolog, which allows for uh, logic programming. And logic programming is another kind of uh, declarative paradigm in which you define the environment that you, are, that you want to describe. And somehow the problem is solved by itself. Bigas, hey, a new one. Hey, new time viewer here. What are you cooking? I'm here. Hi, Bigas. Uh, lovely to see you here. We are on lesson number, I don't even remember. In fact, I think that I, yep, I even forgot to update the title of my stream. Um, this is the Inglorious Academy, and we are learning uh, web programming. Uh, starting with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. This is lesson number 22. So I'm going to update on my, on my phone. This is lesson number 22, and uh, we are looking at JavaScript classes. Um, I was uh, talking a little more than usual. Usually we write code, but I'm talking about uh, classes uh, more verbally here because I want to sh tell people what I feel li uh, about classes. And what I feel like is that I've been working on JavaScript for multiple years. I never needed classes starting from when React stopped. Uh, uh, well, they d didn't stop using classes, but React uh, started uh, allowing you to define uh, components as functions. So nowadays I don't use classes at all especially when I'm writing JavaScript code. Even on the back end, there are some frameworks that rely on classes, but I usually use frameworks that do not rely on classes, and I prefer other programming paradigms such as 
functional programming. We did a little bit of functional programming uh, recently. It was uh, currying, co function composition, etc., etc. Now I'm going to give a sneak peek on classes. Then I hope that we will be able to have a look at error handling in JavaScript. And then we will have a look at one of the main bosses in JavaScript uh, learning, which is asynchronous behavior. So we will look at promises and the async await um, construct in JavaScript. Uh, I don't know what to say about, yeah, okay, classes. Let me just update the notification of the go live. Classes, error handling, and uh, async. And that's it. I think we're done. Update information. And now we can go back to, okay. So I hope this is your capotee, big ass. Um, of course, we are not starting from the beginning. This is lesson number 22, which is even more because we also had a Christmas special, a New Year special, an Easter special. And we are moving towards the end of the program, actually. I have slides, but most of the times I'm actually um, referring to a tutorial that you can find online for free. It's not even mine. It's for you to, to use. And it's called javascript.info. I really love this tutorial. I usually follow this tutorial and also give a little bit of my own recipes and all my personal touch. Okay, so we're talking about uh, different kinds of uh, paradigms and there's also logical logic programming. I learned it at university and I became pretty good at it and then I completely forgot how it works because I never had to use it anymore. Sorry for that because I really liked it. And then there's object-oriented programming which is another kind of paradigm and we could say that object-oriented programming is another kind of declarative uh, way of programming because when you want to solve a problem in object-oriented programming, you actually define the problem as different objects that have relationships one with each other and interact with each other. And, well, the promise that object program programming does is uh, the problem will be solved by itself, which is completely untrue, unfortunately. I really like the concept behind object-oriented programming because it looks like uh, being in the matrix in which you start looking at the world as a series of different objects uh, that interact with each other and the world becomes clear to you and you are able to dodge bullets. But it's not really like this. Biga says, this is really fantastic. I really wish I knew about this channel when I was learning this stuff. Having to grind through a lot of the ambiguity that is JavaScript, coupled with the change in mindset that object-oriented, you are doing the Lord's work. Whoa, nice. Thanks. The, that being said, I agree. I find myself using functional programming paradigms as well. Yeah. Another fellow functional programmer. <laughs> so what, what I found out about object-oriented programming is that uh, I used to love it and uh, use it a lot and I also teach it nowadays I still teach it in my uh, well in my paid courses I teach this instead of in um, in addition to domain driven design which is tightly coupled with this uh, concept of object oriented programming domain driven design means that you are going to design your software you are going to design your solution I'll let you get back to it, though. Have fun. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Speed Gas. Um, I'm, I'm very happy that you were interacting with me. Um, so feel free to stick with us and uh, give yours or your, your personal touch if you want to. So domain-driven design is uh, a kind of uh, a way of uh, designing software that is driven by the domain. What is the domain? Well... If you look at the world around you, the world around you can have a specific subset of it, which is part of your problem. Let's say that we want to create um, an online shop. So the online shop uh, has some concepts, which probably you know, something like the cart or the product or the price or the category in which the pro to which the product belongs. 
etc the customer or other things that belong to your world of interest this is your domain the domain is just a portion of the world that is the portion of the world that um how you can say uh that belongs to the problem your problem lives inside of this subset of the world and in domain driven design and in object oriented programming you define the problem as the objects that describe your domain of interest it's called the domain model usually usually it's a model so it's not the whole thing it's just an approximation of your domain of interest and so for example if you want to create uh, an online shop you probably need to create a class called cart a class called product a class called category and then you make those classes interact with each other okay so for example the cart will add a product inside of it etc etc so this looks pretty nice and uh, I, I'm telling you, on paper, it looks awesome. But then you start to realize that just dealing with those objects is not enough. Sometimes you need also, uh, I don't know, an object that parses an XML, an object that also uh, requests information from uh, a web service. Uh, sometimes you need uh, an object that uh, responds to the requests coming from a client and dispatches the re those requests to your objects, uh, those objects that belong to the domain model, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So at a certain point, you start to think, well, this is pretty complicated and there are so many different ways to solve the same thing. And most of the times you, you use the wrong approach. Most of the times you use the wrong tools. That's why it is very important when you're doing object-oriented programming to discover, learn, and apply the so-called design patterns. Design patterns are, let's say, well, let's read it. They are general reusable solutions to a commonly occurring problem within a given context in software design. So a software design pattern is somehow a recipe that you can use and reuse multiple times when you want to solve a problem of the same kind. So you have to solve a problem, you see that this problem has a shape that you remember, and then you apply a standard solution that you didn't come up with yourself, you just learn it from a book. For example, the famous book from the Gang of Four called Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software, published in 1994 by four people who are now uh, commonly called the Gang of Four. And this is a very important book that every software engineer, software developer should learn as soon as they discover object-oriented programming. And in my personal experience, I started loving object-oriented programming, then I loved design patterns, I started applying design patterns successfully, and then I wanted to teach those design, design patterns everywhere, and I'm still doing this. But then, at a certain point, something else clicked. I discovered, or I rediscovered, functional programming, and I discovered function composition, and curing, etc., etc., and I found out that functional programming does the same things that object-oriented programming does but it does it in a simpler way without even sometimes the need for learning design patterns well it's still better if you know them and maybe try to apply them in the functional world but nowadays i feel that object-oriented programming is an over complication of your problem. In fact, nowadays we also have this uh, joke, which I already told you probably, which is, I had a problem, I used Java, now I have a problem factory. What is a problem factory? A problem factory is one of those design patterns. It's an abstract factory. Abstract factory is one of those uh, solutions, standard solutions, that you can uh, learn and apply them as soon as you need them. But as you can see, even from this uh, simple example, knowing about abstract factory requires you to start 
thinking of objects as this uh, uh, this huge complex diagram in which you have uh, an interface called abstract factory which is implemented by two concrete factories and then the concrete factory will instantiate the product one which belongs to the interface abstract product a but there's also another implementation which is product a2 and then the client is going to import the abstract factory is going to import that product there blah 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 as you can see things are getting quite complicated Probably I already mentioned this, but in the 90s and probably early 2000s, software engineers felt very important and uh, they felt really cool guys that had to deal with very complex designs and object-oriented programming probably fueled this uh, false confidence that software engineers had about the fact that the software is a very complex thing and we need very complex tool, tools to, to deal with, uh, with complex problems. Uh, software engineering, software design uh, patterns are very, very complex things that allow you to solve complex problems. But there are some very easy principles uh, at, at the base of all these uh, patterns which you can use also in other paradigms, such, such as functional programming. And those concepts, those principles, are actually free there. They, you are already using them. It's just common sense, but applied to your code. And one of those principles, for example, is called composition over inheritance. Composition over inheritance. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, I'm a little late. Hi, Sao. Composition over inheritance is a principle that we use in object-oriented programming in which we decide once and for all that most of the times you don't want to use inheritance. You don't want to use a class that extends another class. It's better to have a class that uses another class. It's better to have uh, a class that, it, that invokes a method on another class, but not a class that uh, inherits another class. So that was quite disappointing for me at first. So the cool thing about classes is inheritance. And now there's a principle that say, no, please don't use inheritance. Just use it as, uh, as sparingly as possible because it's much better not to do it. And this applies a lot to most of the design patterns that I know about. Most of these design patterns, if not all of them, do not rely on inheritance. In fact, they implicitly rely on the principle of composition over inheritance. And if you think about the JavaScript that we did so far, we are using functions. Functions invoke other functions. Functions can be composed together. We never created a function that inherits from another function. That's the application of composition over inheritance without even knowing it. If you use functional programming, you are already applying composition over inheritance because in functional programming, you cannot inherit anything. And instead, when you're doing classes, you can inherit, but it's better not. So why use, why use classes in the first place? Um, there are many people out there which are deluded by object-oriented programming. Uh, maybe I can say object-oriented delusion. There are no upsides to object-oriented programming, says this guy here. There's uh, this one here. Object-oriented programming is an expensive disaster, which must end. <laughs> As you can see, there are people which are very angry at object-oriented pro programming. Um, I'm not angry at object-oriented programming, but I, I can understand why object-oriented programming is not as famous as before. Biga says, I hate to interrupt, I just looked and couldn't really find a table of contents to your lecture, but it would be fantastic to know if you're going to go over interfaces today. They still boggle my mind. Additionally, while I'm asking, I'm hoping you that you might have lectures on anything involving AI, ML, DL, RL. I'm currently going through and trying to implement DQN, but the stuff is hard. 
it is. It would be great to get this kind of instruction at that level. Okay, um, actually, my Inglorious Academy is for beginners. We started from scratch without even knowing how to install a program on the computer. And now we are concluding the basics of JavaScript. Once we finish the Academy, which will be pretty soon, I think in uh, a few lessons, a few Saturdays, then I will start adding some concepts which are more advanced and more optional. They are just uh, concepts for those who, who really want them. And I was probably, uh, I'm willing to focus a little more on things that can provide a job for the people that are following me. So as soon as we finish with, uh, uh, with JavaScript, maybe we can start with a JavaScript framework like React because there's a lot of demand in the market about React. And, um, or we can do some uh, server side code. We can build uh, a little backend server in Node.js together. And we can also go to TypeScript. So the static typing interfaces and uh, generics. Uh, I would like to host some of my friends, which are experts in AI, machine learning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And for example, I was already talking with a friend of mine, Marina. Marina is a great, a great uh, data scientist. She, I think, she's got a PhD in data science, and she is teaching data science in Italy. Uh, she speaks a very good English and she already uh, did some workshops on uh, AI and machine learning um, together with me. So I would like at a certain point to also host people that are much more uh, uh, expert on certain topics. But, um, you know, for now, I will stick to the basics. And if you want to see, um, let me just check here. If you want to have a look on the program, this, if I'm able to write it, is it like this? Let me see. Uh, I see Academy. Yeah, tinyurl.com, I see Academy. This link should send you to the, drive, the Google Drive folder in which I have all my slides. This is the, uh, these are the slides for the whole Inglorious Academy. And as you will see, there's nothing about AI, ML, etc., because those are uh, optional concepts that I will probably bring uh, further on after the Academy has finished. And then I will go back to the Academy probably next year, starting from next uh, uh, October. I will start all over again for a fresh new batch of students. Probably. Let's see. Anyway, going back to OOP, um, there's many people who criticize object-oriented programming. I, I think you, you understood the gist, so let's not complain anymore about object-oriented programming. But as you can see, this is why I think that class-based inheritance is not that important. Because nowadays, there's even people that tell you, no, let's just not use it, it's better not. Classes allow you to also define static properties and static methods. So let's uh, create a new class here. So again, new file, <coughs> classes.js. So what is a class? Let's create a class like uh, rabbit or animal. Class animal. This is a class. An animal can have any property and you can define those properties right in the class and you can even initialize those properties right in the class. For example, uh, I can say that by default an animal has... Uh, I don't know, animal is too generic. Uh, the animal can have... Uh, I don't know, let's say it's something stupid like... Uh, Name is equal to Roger. Okay, I see this thing not working actually. Parsing error and expected token ESLint. But I'm not really sure about that. I think that this is a kind of syntax that we can use in certain scenarios. Is it possible here? Yes, it is. New animal name. Yep. So ESLint is telling me that this is an error. 
but it's not actually an error. You stick to the basics, I'll stick to basic and ASM and C. Magicarol, so good to see you back again. Yeah, <laughs> you stick to basic, but have a look at also, uh, also at some uh, high level programming languages. Uh, basic is also nice, however. So, uh, this is not actually an error. This was an error because this is a new feature in classes. You can define properties and declare them as property name equal property value. Uh, before a certain version of JavaScript, this is, was not possible. And the initialization of a property should have been always in the constructor. Constructor in which you say this dot name is equal to Roger. This is just a shorthand way to do the same thing. You initialize a property without needing to create a constructor in which you say this dot name is equal to Roger. But these are actually, actually exactly the same. So this is a property. This is the same property initialized inside of the constructor. And then you also have methods like set name given name this is a setter method setter methods are methods that usually set a property like this dot name is equal to name this is a setter method and a getter method is usually something like this get name returns this dot name i'm going very fast but this is exactly what we wrote uh, two saturdays ago when uh, creating the class person getters and setters but we don't need to only do this uh, a method can be anything it can be calculate your age or uh, i don't know uh, run speak let's do let's do run run i'm just going to console log uh, i don't know running okay and then we can have speak and speak can do console log of uh, speaking. I don't know what an animal should do. Okay, so we can do whatever we want. And these are all instance attributes and instance methods, which means that I cannot invoke those methods on the class animal. I have to invoke those methods on an object, which is an instance of the class animal, which means that I can create a new animal, const animal is equal to new animal, and then now that I've got this instance, I can do things with this instance. I can, for example, get its name with animal.name because in JavaScript, I'm, well, this is actually a lie because there's a new feature that allows you to do this. But in current JavaScript, let's say that properties cannot be private. They're always public. You can always access them. So you can do animal.name, which will get the name of the animal. And you can also access the property, the same properties as get name by using the getter method. Or you can say animal.set name. I'm going to say another name. I'm going to put Magica Ross. And now the animal has a name of Magica Ross. I don't, I'm not saying you're an animal. I'm sorry. I uh, don't want you. To, to be enraged by this. Um, let, let's not use people's names uh, or people's nick's names. Um, what's a famous animal? Miss Quackers, which is my, my duck debugging tool. Okay, so we can use those. Uh, we can ask the animal to run and we can ask the animal to also speak. Okay, this is how you deal with classes and objects. You define what every object of class animal should be like, should look like, and should behave like. And then you instantiate, you initialize a new animal, sometimes with parameters, sometimes with not. These parameters are, if you pass parameters here, those will be passed in the constructor. And this makes a huge difference between initializing properties like this and initializing properties like this. In fact, when you initialize a property like this, you must know in advance which is the string that you want to pass as name. In the constructor instead, you can decide in a second moment what is the name of your animal. You initialize it in the constructor 
with a dynamic parameter. So it means that here I can say that the animal is called Roger, but because I decided it, not because the class decided it. Okay? So I already told you that properties are usually public. They can be accessible. If you don't want them to be accessible and you want to control how they are accessed, maybe, for example, with a getter method like get name, there's no way, at least for now, we'll see that there is a way, but for now, let's say that there is no way to make this property uh, private. And the only thing that you can do is to use a convention, which is usually starting the name of the property with a low dash, with an underscore. And this doesn't make the property less public. It is just a suggestion for the person that uses your class to say, hey, please, this is a private property. Don't touch it. Don't access it uh, directly. Please access it indirectly through a getter, a setter, or whatever, whatever it is. Okay? Here I can say this.name uh, is running. So we have a reason to use this.name. Okay, something like this. I, I don't know. I'm just uh, I'm just fiddling around. Uh, the most important part is the is the concept, of course, not to the real um, the real code here. So the property name or now underscore name is supposed to be a private property. It's not because you cannot make it private. But at least the underscore that uh, that starts the the word suggests the user of your class, hey, please don't touch this property, not directly at least, please use some other methods. Because maybe this property must be accessed in specific ways and you don't want people to mess up with the property directly. Okay, so this is how you define a class. Uh, ESLint is complaining about this unexpected token, but it's uh, actually wrong. And if I want ESLint to understand I don't even know if uh, ESLint can understand this. I think that this kind of uh, property definition started with ECMAScript, I don't know, 7, 8. Uh, let's see. Class property initialization. Property initializer. Is it this one? Mm, no. No, I don't think so. Nope. Uh, so let's see, what is object initializer here? Nah, this is completely different. I'm pretty sure that this is a feature that we have in JavaScript starting from version X. What is here? Here it says that ESLint is going to look at ECMAScript version 12, ES2021, so it should be the latest version. And ESLint is not understanding this. That's strange. Anyway, as you can see, these properties and these methods can only be accessed when you instantiate a new object of that class, and then you can invoke those methods and you can inspect those properties on the object, not on the class. But there are some properties that you can attach directly to the class. And it's actually the same as saying, hey, class animal, please uh, add something like, I don't know, the property pi for some reason, or hey animal, uh, attach a function like handle click, which is an arrow function. So as you can see, I'm attaching properties and methods to the class and not to the object. Why? Well, the reason here is that, first of all, because I can. Because in JavaScript, everything is an object. You can attach properties and methods to anything, even arrays, even functions. You can do whatever you want. And this makes JavaScript probably even more object-oriented than other languages such as Java and C Sharp, because everything is an object. And you can access anything as if it was an object. And the other reason why I'm doing this is that sometimes you want 
to specify properties and methods that do not really belong to a specific instance of a class, but that belong to every kind of class. And you already probably have some, um, some examples out there in the JavaScript world. For example, when we use math.py or math. Dot, um, what did we say? Pow, like the power of uh, a number elevated to the nth power. These can be seen as properties and methods attached to an object called math. But maybe math is not an object. Maybe it's a class that allows you to create new objects of kind math, which is not, <laughs> probably not, but it looks like. And the same goes with console. Console is probably a global object to which I can ask a method like log. But what about dates? You remember dates? You can create a new date by saying const now is equal to new date, right? And now we've got a, an object now, which is an instance of the class date. So now I have multiple properties and methods that I can ask to this specific object, to this specific instance of a class. But I'm pretty sure that if I start typing date dot something, ooh, even date has properties and methods. For example, it has this one here, date dot now, which I think is a method that tells you, that gives you, I don't know if this, yeah, this is the timestamp of the current date. So now is a method that I can ask not to a specific date, but to the date class, because I just want to know when is now. <laughs> okay, so there are some stat, some, some class properties and class methods that you can attach directly to the class instead of uh, using them on an object. Uh, another thing that we saw probably was JSON stringify. Again, JSON stringify. Is this a method of an object called JSON or is JSON a class? I cannot even tell. Apparently, it is an object, an intrinsic object that provides function to convert JavaScript values, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, it is an object. But sometimes, you, you see, you don't want to instantiate an object and then invoke the method on that object. Sometimes you want to have some global object to which you want to ask to do things, or like in date, uh, you want to ask something directly to a class. And date is not even a class. As you can see, it's called date constructor. So probably it's a constructor, it's not a class. But who cares about that? In JavaScript, everything is so uh, foggy. <laughs> Everything can be an object or a class, a constructor function. A class is actually sugar syntax for constructor functions. So we don't really care too much about that. The only thing that I want to tell you is that from a syntax point of view, if you want to define uh, a property that is attached directly to the class and not to the object, which is an instance of a class, you can attach it just like I did after you define the class or you can uh, attach it directly inside of the class definition by adding a keyword called static. Static pi is equal 3.14. Again, ESLint is complaining, but I'm pretty sure that this works. You just add static, and this is exactly like saying that you are going to attach pi as a property of the class, not of the object. And the same goes with handle click. If you want to create a, a, a um, a class method, you say static handle click. And this is a static method. That's it. As you can see, uh, it's pretty important to notice that constructor, get name, all these methods are not separated with commas like in objects. They usually don't have even a semicolon. It's just, they're just um, defined like this without any semicolon. And I don't know if this is exactly, the same. no, this is not the case for uh, properties. Apparently, Prettier adds those properties back again. And if Prettier is adding properties, it means that regardless of what ESLint says, Prettier knows that this is valid JavaScript. So who cares about ESLint? Okay, um, so we now know 
also about static properties and static methods. All of this is not really that important, and at least until you look at object-oriented programming, which is something that I can mention, but before I'll mention in object-oriented programming, I will have to do a small lesson about TypeScript, this uh, superset of JavaScript. We will look at static typing, we'll look at interfaces, we'll look at generics, and then we can start doing some object-oriented programming. And if I was uh, a good teacher, you would say, what is this crap? I don't like object-oriented programming. But prob probably not. I actually have some students that prefer object-oriented programming uh, it, and they prefer Angular rather than React. It's just a matter of taste. It's just a matter of how you, you like things or your mindset. So that's... Uh, Pretty understandable if you still uh, like classes better than plain functions. So, uh, class syntax, we already saw it. You define a class, you define a constructor optionally. You don't need to, but if you want to initialize properties, then you have the constructor. And some languages do also have a destructor because they also want to free the memory when you destroy an object of that class. But that's not the case for JavaScript, for Java, for C Sharp, because there is the garbage collector which destroys things for you. So you don't need a destructor. Um, okay, constructor, methods, etc., etc. And yeah, I don't think we need to go too much in detail on this. Uh, one thing that I didn't tell you, however, is that there is a special way to create getters and setters. In JavaScript, you can even write something like this, get space name, and this behaves like a getter, and set space name, which behaves like a setter. For example, in this case, it doesn't just set the value, it first checks if the length of the value is 4. Uh, if it's uh, less than 4, then it will alert, no, the name is too short, and I'm not going to set that value. But if the value length is greater than or equal to 4, then in that case, yes, I will set the value. So, you see why getters and setters could be important. Because this way you have control if you really want to get or set a value, and how you want to get or set that value. And that's why it is usually better to avoid having the name being a public property. There's an error here, there's a typo in this code. Objective-C, yeah, in Objective-C you've got this kind of things too. And I think also in C-sharp actually, I think that there are some, uh, they are, I think that they are called properties. Um, not really sure about that, C-sharp properties. In C-sharp, yeah, you see, in C-sharp you have this, get return seconds divided by 3600 and set, which does this. So you can define the property called hours and then you define the getter and setters for that property, something like that. So you see the syntax is very similar. Sometimes it's, uh, yeah, it's just a matter of syntax, but the concept is, is there. Uh, and in Objective-C, Objective-C, let's see, getters, setter. Please explain getter and setter in Objective-C. Yep, so you can add this, uh, so some. I usually call it annotation because I come from Java, but I don't know if it's called an annotation there, here. And yeah, you got things like int some number return 42, which looks like a function, but probably it's not. So yeah, we've got many different syntaxes, but they all behave exactly the same. I was saying there's a typo in here, and I don't know if you saw the typo, but I think that the typo is that, just like I did, this guy decided to use the underscore convention to say that the name should be a private property which should not be accessed from outside. Oh, it's not a typo. And then they say this dot name is equal to name, but this is implicitly invoking the setter, so it's not a typo. This was actually intended. So what is the difference between doing get name like this and doing get name like I did? 
Well, the difference is that getName is a method and I have to invoke it as, an, uh, as a method. So animal.getName. But if instead I write get name like this, well, this is invoked as a property. I can call it like this animal.name. And it looks like a property, but it's actually invoking this method as a getter. And that's one important reason why I should use the underscore on the private property, on the property that I'd want to be accessed immediately. Because this way I have a difference between name, the public version, and underscore name, the private version, which I don't want to access directly. However, in my experience, I never had to use get name or set name in JavaScript. Never in my life. Um, I think that they tell you why, probably. Uh, you can compute names, and you already know this. You can compute a key, like say plus hi, but why should you do that? Please don't. And class fields. As you can see, this is the syntax that I used, which was uh, uh, which angered ESLint, but it actually works. So yeah, this is called class fields. So let's do something. ESLint class field. ESLint complains about class fields. Yeah, that's my problem. Is there a way to solve this? Let's see. The class fields proposal, said this guy two years ago, is still at T3, TC39 stage 3 recommendation. So ESLint won't support it until it reaches stage 4. There's probably not too much we can do that unless we start processing everything with Babel, blah, blah, blah. So after two years, is ESLint still complaining or is there a way to turn off this problem? Oh, this was... Uh, five years old so still don't know ESLint class fields again let's see this one static properties ECMA version oh, okay okay yeah so apparently ESLint by itself is not able to understand this kind of syntax and we have to add another package called Babel ESLint Babel or Babel, Babel. Babel is this package, this uh, beautiful transpiler compiler that is able to translate any kind of language into any other kind of language. And it's the it's the program, the application that we usually use when writing any kind of software in any kind of framework. And under the hood, you can write the newest kind of JavaScript and this new kind of JavaScript will be converted into old kind of JavaScript. One thing that I can show you here probably is try it out. Here I can write some code, for example, class animal. And I'm going to write a property like name. This seems to be working, but now that I created a property here, on the right, you can see that apart from class animal, which uses a constructor, it also uses a function that's defined right here called define property that does a lot of stuff and it uses this define property to define the property name with value of Roger. And I don't really care what this thing does, but Babel allows me to write this kind of code, which is the newest kind of code, and it will be translated automatically in some code that still works if even if class fields are not supported. And what about get? Let, let's do the getter. Get name, which returns this dot name. Okay, no, this is actually recognized. But this is recognized because we are using these presets here. Stage 2, React. What if I'm... I don't know. Stage 0. This is still working. I don't know how to use this thing, actually. I'm just... Uh, I'm just messing around. 
decorators, React, Flow, TypeScript. Oh, we can even use TypeScript. Something like this. Yeah, apparently. I can add static typing and this is recognized as plain JavaScript once transpiled, once, co once compiled in the different language. So uh, there's another thing that I wanted to show you here, but apparently I'm not able to... Oh, wait a second. Yeah, probably I can. I can... I can change this one here, maybe. Nope. What about this? Oh, okay. So I messed around and I said, I want my code to be compatible with uh, the default browsers, but also with Internet Explorer 11. Before that, it was not Internet Explorer 11. So I don't want to be compatible with Internet Explorer 11. I don't care about that. Internet Explorer 11 doesn't know, does, doesn't have the concept of classes. So if I exclude the compatibility with Internet Explorer 11, I can use classes as they are. But if I want to include the compatibility with Internet Explorer 11, I have to transform this class code into something that is not using classes. And you can see that the code here is pretty big. But the code is actually converting the definition of a class into something that is similar to a class. In fact, we see a var animal, which is equal to, I don't know where this comment, pure. It's a function. It's actually an IIFE. This is an immediately invoked function expression. See, Bobby? It's an immediately invoked function expression, which declares a constructor functional animal. And then it invokes this method, this function called create class on the animal with these properties here. And what is this create class? It's something that was injected by Babel itself. And I don't even care to know what it does. But as you can see, every new construct that we are using in JavaScript can be passed through Babel, which will translate our code, our new and shiny code, into some code that is compatible with the browsers that you are targeting. And this is awesome, because this way you are allowed to use always the latest version of the language, and you are pretty sure that this newest version of the language will work even on older browsers. This is not the case with other languages. For example, in Java, if you have an environment that only supports Java 8, you probably need to stick with Java 8. If you start using Java 11 and all the features of Java 11, these will not be compatible with the environment Java 8, and uh, it will destroy your code. Bobby says, yeah, I see, Babel knows what's best. Exactly. And the cool thing about Babel is that you usually don't even need to configure it. You don't even need to use it. It's already there when you are using the tools uh, to build your, uh, your web application. So I really hope that we will be able soon to look at a little bit of React, this beautiful framework by uh, Facebook, which I love and use a lot, and it's very required in the market. So I would highly recommend you to study React. And in React, we already have Babel there. So we can write the latest version of JavaScript and it will just work on every browser. Okay, so now that we know what is up with, um, with ESLint complaining about this, we can go forward. Blah, 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 making bound methods. I don't care about that. Summary, and that's it. Class inheritance. We already know what class inheritance is. It means that I can define a class rabbit, which extends the class animal. So it means that it has, it inherits everything that an animal does, but it can also add new methods like hide. I don't think that animal had a a hide, so it adds new behavior because a rabbit is like an animal, but it's also able to hide. So I can add this method in addition to an animal. And uh, the rabbit can also override some behavior that was defined in animal, just like we did with this very, very wrong and uh, misogynistic example, which is I have a class of woman, which extends person, and when I ask a woman her age, she will tell her e real age only if the age is less than or equal 25. 
This is not true, not really, but it's just to prove the point of being able to extend another class and also changing the default behavior of the base class by just adding some code and optionally referring to the method that was defined in the base class by using this super keyword. So now we have these two keywords. This means this object belonging to, to this class and super means the base class from which I'm inheriting, okay? And is this inheritance really that important? No, it is not. As I told you, inheritance is all even considered a bad practice nowadays, unless, well, there are some specific scenarios in which it's more convenient to have uh, a class that extends another class, but most of the time it's not. If I look at React, I'm just going to give you some sneak peeks about React. If you look at the tutorials on React, you will probably see some uh, example code. If I can find it. Where is that? Learn React, practical tutorial. Before we start. No, I want to start. Okay. Look at this React code. The first thing that it does is to create a class called shopping list which extends react.component. So it extends something that, well, is provided by React itself. And then this class has a method called render. You remember that we did an exercise together in which we used this, exactly this name. And I wanted to do this because I wanted to prepare you to uh, React's syntax. And in the render method, it does things which are kind of strange because it's mixing HTML and also some JavaScript. In fact, this is not plain JavaScript. This is called JSX because it's JavaScript mixed with some sort of XML syntax. But we don't really care about the contents of the render method. What we care about is that in React, if we want to create something called a component, we have to define a class which extends React component. And usually it also needs to have a render method. But this is, let's say, old React. In fact, React, starting from version 16, if I remember correctly, allows you to define a component with plain functions. So you don't need to know about classes if you want to use React. There's only two cases in which you have to use classes, but they are very, very niche cases, and we don't need to care about those. I usually write my React components as pure functions. I don't use classes for React components anymore. <clears throat> so class inheritance is nice. It's a feature of object-oriented languages. It's strictly related to classes. You want classes because you want to support inheritance. And then you happen to know that we don't really like inheritance. So please don't use it. Uh, one other example that I can tell you about classes and inheritance is with a game. Let's say that I want to build Super Mario. So I can define a class called Mario. And Mario is a class that is able to jump, to run, to, to do whatever you want. Let's say that it jumps. Yeah. Let's say that it jumps and uh, it says console log jumping. Okay, and let's say that it runs also. And we can say that this is running. And Mario also has some, uh, uh, we can say it has some health or hit points because the base Mario, if, it's, uh, if it is hit once, it just dies, right? So we can say that the health is one and as soon as I hit Mario, health is zero and Mario dies. Uh, we can also talk about his height, maybe. The height is one because Mario is small Mario and it's, it's small. So he's able to, uh, to, to pass through very small and narrow passages, right? Unlike Super Mario, which is bigger. 
Then we can define a class called Super Mario. And Super Mario is very similar to Mario. In fact, we can say that it extends Mario. Okay? Super Mario, however, has more health because it has two hit points. Super Mario, when I hit him, it shrinks into Mario. And then I can hit him again in order to have health zero. So I could say health is two. And the height is also two because Super Mario is bigger than regular Mario. And that's it probably. Super Mario is also able to jump and run, so it inherits jump and run from base Mario. And that's it. But then we also have Fireball Mario. Well, Fireball Mario is Mario that is a Super Mario, or even Mario that takes the Fireball flower, and now is able to shoot fireballs. So Fireball Mario, uh, I would say that extends Super Mario because it looks a lot like Super Mario. In fact, it has two health points, and it is high as Super Mario. But if I remember correctly, when I ask Fireball Mario to run. He's actually shooting and also running. I remember that, at least in early Marios, you just had one button to run and the same button allowed Fireball Mario to also shoot those fireballs. Am I right? I don't remember actually. Hopeful. Hopefully. So Fireball Mario is very similar to Super Mario and I can say that he extends Super Mario like this. And then in other um, Super Marios, we also have Cape Mario. Remember? Cape Mario is the Mario that uh, looks a lot like Super Mario. And Cape Mario has a health of 2, has a height of 2. But, yeah, uh, I don't have a very good example on this. But we can say that if I try to jump with Cape Mario, he's actually going to glide. Not really true, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Yeah, Cape Mario jumps twice, and if you jump while in mid-air, he, he will start gliding. At least in Super Mario World, I think, right? Something like this. So, now we've got this um, nice <coughs> zoo of uh, inheritance. We've got a tree. Uh, we've got Mario, we've got a Super Mario that extends Mario, we've got a Fireball Mario that extends Super Mario, we've got Cape Mario that extends Super Mario, and uh, I think I have some slides on that, because this is a course that I usually give on uh, design patterns, object oriented programming, etc. Maybe I can show it... Um, let me see here... Yep! I do have these slides. So I was look. I was talking about Mario. For Super Mario, I need a 6502 assembler and 32 kilobytes of ROM. <laughs> Good luck finding them nowadays. Yeah, probably you can find them. Okay, so how do you build Mario? One thing that we are doing is this. We are using inheritance. So we've got a base Mario and we've got Super Mario, which extends Base Mario, and we've got Fire Mario, which extends Super Mario, and Cape Mario, which extends Super Mario. Something like this. The problem with this architecture is that what if we want to create a new Mario? I will call it Ultra Mario, which is able to, to uh, fire fireballs, but also glide. So it should extend Fireball Mario and also Cape Mario. How do I do this? Well, I cannot. And this is the problem that we have with Inheritance. With Inheritance, I can extend Fireball Mario and I can extend Cape Mario, but not both. This is a so-called diamond problem. Um, let me see if... Uh, yeah, multiple Inheritance. Multiple inheritance is this situation here, in which we have a class A that is uh, overridden by class B and class C, but you also want to have a class D which inherits from both B and C. Multiple inheritance is usually 
not possible in programming languages. There are some programming languages that allow you to do this, but not Java and not JavaScript, at least not with classes. Ortunado says inject. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, if you think about dependence injection, we can do something like dependence injection and dependence injection is one of those patterns which are very important in uh, object-oriented programming languages but well it's probably not even a pattern like right now it's a technique it's a principle uh, i wouldn't even say that it's a, a pattern in fact it's not even uh, described in the gang of four book design patterns so dependency injection is something that is being me got the apron programming some okay, i i'm not able to to even read what you wrote w27c265 just laying around okay <laughs> Uh, I don't remember if you're on Discord, but if you're not on Discord, please uh, get on Discord and sh share with us the cool things that you are doing, because I'm so curious about what you're saying. I have no idea what you're saying, but I'm so curious to see it. Uh, okay, so we have this problem of multiple inheritance, and there's another problem which is not strictly related to multiple inheritance. The problem is with the dynamic behavior of this structure that I'm building. If I want, if my Mario gets a mushroom, then with this kind of architecture, I have to destroy my current Mario and instantiate a new object of class Super Mario, which extends Mario. And if uh, Super Mario gets a flower, then I must destroy the Super Mario and create a new Fireball Mario. So I'm killing Mario multiple times. Every time he has to change its state, I have to kill Mario and create a new Mario, a new copy of itself uh, with different properties. I don't think this is the best way to model our Super Mario game. And in fact, in video games, we never use, almost never use inheritance. We, used, we use composition over inheritance. And in these slides, which maybe one day I will tell you in detail, I am suggesting even other two ways of building your Mario. One is with a pattern that you can find in the Gang of Four book. It's called strategy, or sometimes it's called state, sometimes it's called type. And you have one Mario that, instead of inheriting stuff, uh, is delegating through an, to another class called type. Mario has a type, and the type can be of kind base, fire, super, cape. These are all classes that extend, actually they implement an interface, probably. And type Mario, sh this way, should not be just destroyed and recreated. Type Mario is there and I can just destroy and create different types attached to it. This is modeling Mario as a state machine somehow. It has multiple states and it can transition between states. Another way that I can solve the problem is with the decorator pattern, also called proxy sometimes, it's slightly different, and it uses the inversion of control. So uh, what uh, Ortunado was saying, injection, well, yeah, uh, I wouldn't say dependence injection, but I would say, yes, I could invert the control. I could use inversion of control and I could have Mario as an interface, which is implemented by different kinds of Mario, base Mario, super decorator, fire decorator, cape decorator. And this is a way to wrap your objects with other objects. It looks science fiction in the world of classes, this is a solution that is way overlooked by programmers that usually rely on inheritance and then feel the pain afterwards. But this, in functional programming languages, is as easy as saying, hey, you've got a function, you just invoke it from inside of another function. That's it. So all the decorator proxy inversion of control in the world of functional programming languages is already there for you and it usually is the best solution out there because it's the most flexible and reliable and even the most testable and predictable way 
So, as you can see, I'm not fond of inheritance. Uh, let's go back here. Blah, blah, blah. You can override methods. We already saw this. You can even override the constructor if you want to. But who cares about that since I probably convinced you by now that inheritance is not that, that good as it sounds. Okay, static properties and methods. We already saw this. You just add the static keyword and your method becomes static, which means that you can invoke this method not on the object that you instantiated from the class, but on the class itself. For example, this static method, you just invoke it on the class user without even needing to instantiate, to create a new object of that class. Oh, okay, it was 256, not 265. Ah, of course, of course. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've got... Uh, okay, this, this can be a, a good example, a good, well, real-world example. You've got this class called article. The article of a blog, for example, has a title and a date, which you specify on the constructor, so you can create multiple objects of kind article, one, each one having their different title and their different date. But then... You want to also have a static method called compare, which is the comparator function that allows you to sort the articles based on, for example, their dates. So now we've got an array of articles that contains objects of kind article. So new article HTML with this date, new article CSS with this date, etc., etc. And then you can ask the uh, array of articles to sort itself given article.compare. Compare has no reason to be a method of a single object because we want to compare all the articles here. So we are going to attach this compare function as a static method that we can ask to the class article. Or we can just put it somewhere else, I don't care. Uh, since it's related, strictly related to articles, yes, it's a good thing to add it as a static method on the class article. Um, create today's, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And we also have static properties like this one. So, okay. Yeah, that was a good uh, example. Not name, but animal belongs to planet Earth. Every animal belongs to planet Earth. So if you ask the animal class, where does it belong? It belongs to planet Earth. And again, we've got run with a speed, we've got the static comparator function, we've got the rabbit which extends animal and is able to also hide. So we can create an array of rabbits and we can ask the rabbits to compare themselves, even if the rabbit doesn't have a compare function. Rabbit doesn't have a compare static method, but it inherits from animal and animal does have a compare method. So now, every class that extends the class animal will also be able to compare itself given the speed, apparently. And yeah, that's it. Now, I already told you about the fact that JavaScript doesn't have private properties and private methods. It's actually wrong and probably it's going to tell us the truth here. Uh, they are going to show you the real-life example. So if you've got this coffee machine, you only see the external surface of the coffee machine. You know how to use the coffee machine. I don't, because I don't use this. I use the mocha or other uh, some, some similar like Nespresso or Lavazza-like machines. So I don't know how to use this one. This is more like a, an American coffee machine, which Italians usually despise. <laughs> And, uh, but let's say that you are able to, uh, to draw the cup away from there. You are able to put coffee from the top. You can put that thing back again. You can put water behind it. You can press a button and that's as easy as you can use a machine. But internally, the machine is very complex. It has a lots, lots of different parts that interact with each other. These are the private parts of the machine. 
And those private parts are not for you to see and to use directly. You only want to see the external part of the machine. You want to see the API, the application programming interface, not the internals of the machine. That's why it is usually a good thing to keep things private. And we already know how to keep things private in some cases. For example, we already saw that an IIFE, an immediately invoked function expression, allows you to declare variables, to make them live, to make them behave, and they will not be accessible from outside. Well, in Java, C Sharp, and other statically typed languages, we can even define some properties or some methods inside of a class as private or protected, which means that they are private but visible from uh, derived classes. But we don't really care too much about that. S still, in other languages, you can add a keyword called private, and this will make the property not accessible from outside. So in our case, if this was Java, if this was Java, we could say private health is equal to one, and the health would not be accessible when I say, hey, new object Mario, give me the health. It would say, no, this property is not accessible. And if you want to access it, you have to use a getter method. Or you cannot, if there's no getter method, you just cannot access it. It will be used to calculate something and you can only access that derived property, but not directly the health of Mario. And in fact, this is a real, real life scenario because you never see the health of Mario. You just see him jumping around alive or dead. So you don't even know if there is a health and what value it has. So yeah, in other languages, we do have the private keyword. In JavaScript, we don't. We usually use the underscore prefix to say, please, this should be private. Don't use it. And, but this is just a suggestion. It's not a way to control the pro privacy of this property. But yeah, there are ways you can do this. And let's see if we can find it. Here it is. This is a recent addition in the JavaScript language. I never used it in my entire career for now, and I don't plan to use it. But this new addition allows you to specify the property with this hash symbol, with a pound symbol in front of it. And this is exactly like saying that this property is private. That's it. When you start with a pound symbol, with a hash symbol, a property or a method, this becomes private and you cannot access it from outside. You cannot do coffee machine dot pound fixed water amount or coffee machine dot pound water limit because it's not accessible from outside. And I really hate this syntax because I find it ugly, ugly to read. I, I'm very distracted by this pound symbol. I would have preferred probably to have a keyword like private rather than have this pound symbol, which ESLint doesn't even recognize, of course, but Prettier does. So I don't like this. I really, really don't like it. Uh, it's, uh, it's disturbing to me, but that's just my private opinion and it should be kept private. Uh, other languages do not have this hash symbol, they do have the private keyword. And that's it. I don't want to extend built-in classes. In fact, it's very important not to extend built-in classes. I can tell you the story about this, uh, a story about this, but I don't know if you're interested right now. And there's also another thing that you can do with classes, which is another beautiful, beautiful feature that classes have and that as soon as you learn it, the teacher always discourages you from using it. There is this operator called instance of, but never use it. <laughs> so nice, I love classes. The instance of operator looks very similar to the type of operator. If you remember, let's open a new tab. 
if you want to check if three is of type number, you say type of three but you have to also type it correctly. Type of three is number. Type of uh, hello is string. And then you have all those strange quirks like uh, what is type of null? Object, okay. And type of an empty array? Object, okay. And what is type of uh, not a number? Number. Okay, so you remember JavaScript is quite buggy on this and they never wanted to solve the problem because they want JavaScript to be always backwards compatible, compatible with every uh, version of JavaScript. So the code that you will write will always be uh, parsable and interpretable by any browser uh, and environment out there. So just like we can check for the type of uh, primitive things or even for objects, but if I check the type of object, they will always tell me that it's just an object, even null is an object. Well, if you're dealing with objects, especially objects that are belonging to a class, that are instantiated from a class, now you can use this operator, obj instance of a certain class, with which you can check if the object that you're inspecting is an instance of some class. So here I'm defining the class rabbit. I'm creating an object as an instance of the class rabbit. And then I'm alerting, is rabbit an instance of rabbit? And it will tell you true. And that's it. You can also avoid this variable and you can say, is new rabbit instance of rabbit? Of course you can. And and then you can do strange things like, apparently, if I have an array, the array is an, is an object that is of, uh, belongs to the class array. But array as a class is a class that inherits from another class called object. So I can even say that the empty array is an instance of object. Because there is this inheritance mechanism going on, an array is just a special kind of object. Array is a class that extends the class object, apparently. And, uh, okay, this is getting too complicated. Okay, this is uh, interesting. You've got a class animal, you've got a class rabbit, which extends animal, you instantiate a rabbit, and then you can check, is the rabbit an instance of rabbit? Yes, of course. But is also the rabbit instance of an animal? Yes, it is also true. Because since rabbit extends animal, then rabbit is a rabbit, but it's also an animal. This is somehow the foundation for polymorphism. Because a rabbit is not only a rabbit, it has multiple shapes. It's a rabbit, but it's also an animal. So it has multiple shapes. It can wear multiple hats. And how does it work? Well, there's a chain of things happening. A rabbit as an object is an instance of rabbit. And the rabbit extends from animal, which in turn extends from object, which in turn extends from null, because object is the base class of everything. So if I want to check if the rabbit is a rabbit, I can say rabbit is instance of rabbit. Yes, it is, because it, uh, it is an instance of that class. But is it also an animal? Yes, because the class from it, which it is in an instance, is also a class that extends animal. But is rabbit an object? Yes, it is. And nothing else, because the chain is, is finished here. Uh, blah, blah, blah. We don't really care about that much. Okay, so this is all probably you need to know about classes. And we're not going to use them uh, unless you really want to. But first, I will focus on the things that you can use in your daily work and you can be <clears throat> also interviewed and hired for. And I'm pretty sure that if you're not going to apply for a job in an enterprise environment or in, a, in a, an environment that uses languages such as Java or C Sharp, you don't need to know about classes. If you go to a company that uses JavaScript, I think that 95% of the times they do not care about classes. Mixins. Mixins are another way you can create 
objects and even multiple inheritance but mixing is just a fancy way to say that you can have multiple objects and you squash them together you remember with the object assign operator or with the spread operator on objects that's a mixing that's it's really nothing more than that. They are applying mixins to classes probably, but I don't really care. The thing that is relevant here is that you are using object assign. So you have two objects, you want to inherit from those two objects, you squash those objects together and you create a new object, which is the merge of those two objects. That's it. That's multiple inheritance in JavaScript, which is not even inheritance. It's just uh, merging things together. So yeah, we don't really care too much about mixins. And that's it for classes. If you want me to do exercises, to go back to them, I can do this. Uh, next Wednesday, during practice session, I will do some exercises on classes. But as you can imagine, I will not spend too much time on that because I don't think it's worth it. Now, before the coffee break, I will tell you a little bit of this uh, other feature that ha every programming language has. It's very easy. And then after the coffee break, we will deal with the monster, which is asynchronous behavior. We already started talking about it with the set timeout and the set interval. But we're going to look at promises and async await. But now error handling. What is error handling? Well, I can tell you pretty easily that error handling is a nice feature that allows you to, let's say, return abruptly from a function if something goes wrong and you can catch the problem that occurred and deal with that problem in a convenient way. You can write code without error handling at all, but error handling is actually pretty convenient sometimes. So it's much better to do this. Let's say that I want to create a function, uh, yeah, function called calculate age. And this function is going to, first of all, ask the user for their name. So, const name is equal to prompt hey there what's your name and of course i have to escape the single quotes this is going to get the name and maybe the user wrote didn't write their name maybe they pressed esc or maybe they uh, pressed OK without really specifying a name. So I can say if the name is null or the length of the name is not what I expected, if the name is less than one character, it probably isn't a valid name. You cannot be just an empty string, come on. So in that case, I want to return abruptly from the function and say, hey, what kind of name is that? Okay. Or if I have a list of swear words, of uh, blacklisted words, I can even check if the name is in that blacklist and say, hey, this cannot be your name, this is a bad word. Now that I've got the name, if everything goes well, I can continue and ask for the age. So age is prompt. Sweet. And what's your age? And again, maybe the age was not correct. Maybe the name, maybe the age is null. Maybe the age uh, is not a finite number, so is it is none a cheese none? And in this case too, I have to return something like uh, I don't know. I don't believe you. And then only after I have all my inputs in place, 
I can try to calculate my age, which is kind of stupid because I asked for the age, so I can just return the age as it is. So I'm not focusing a lot on the uh, real purpose of this function. I'm focusing more on the <coughs> input checking here. Uh, the returning age is actually pretty simple, but maybe I don't want to just return the age. I want to uh, fetch the result from a server, which will do a complex calculation and re return that calculation to me, etc., etc. But things could go wrong in that case too. Maybe I'm trying to communicate with that server and the server is not responding, or maybe it gives me a, 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 a wrong result or whatever. Something wrong could happen all the time. Even if my code is correct, uh, there are exceptions to the rule, to the uh, main flow, the main success flow. And those exceptions can be trapped instead of just returning strings with the use of a special construct, which is errors. So what we can do is to wrap all our code into this block called try catch. Try is a nice word because it tells you that all the code that you wrote is just an attempt. You're just trying to do things. Maybe things could go wrong. And if anything goes wrong, maybe some error will be thrown. And in the catch block, you are catching this error which was thrown just like a ball and you are going to handle this error. For example, you can uh, log the error somewhere. You can send an email to the person responsible of that error. You can fire your employee right away, or you can show a pop-up message to the user. Hey, sorry, an error occurred. Please try again later. You can do whatever you want with that error. You can uh, inspect what kind of error it is, what message it, uh, it, it provides, and then deal with that error somehow. It's actually pretty easy. It's similar to an if-else cascade, because if everything goes wrong, nothing will happen. The code will just be executed. But if anything goes wrong inside of the code, you catch that error and you do, you handle that error uh, any way you want. <clears throat> so this is the flow chart. You start by trying some code. If there are no errors, then it's going to ignore the catch block. Everything worked exactly as expected. But if an error, any error occurred in the code, then I'm going to ignore the rest of the try. The try block, the code that is in the try block, will be abruptly uh, stopped. And I'm going to execute the catch block which is very similar to what we are doing here. Here, we are returning abruptly as soon as we find an error, but we're not going to handle this error here. We're just returning a string. And inside of the calculate age, I have to check if the age is a number, because, well, maybe the age was converted. In this case, I didn't even convert it, so I have to put a plus or a number here. Let's say that I'm not even converting the age. So how am I able to check if the uh, result that was returned from this function is the age or if it's just a string with, an, with the error message inside. Well, this is a good moment to, to talk about uh, errors and try catch. What I can do is to try all of this. So I wrap everything into a try catch. And given an error, sometimes you, you type it as E, sometimes you type it as R, sometimes you type it as error. I don't have a strong opinion on this. I don't like E because E sometimes is also used for events. So I don't like to say E. Error is fine, but why not error? <laughs> just write error. It's just two characters more. Come on, don't be that lazy. So in this case, if there were any errors occurring here, I'm going to do something like console log the error. Or I think that there's also a console error, which uh, is exactly the same as console log, 
but it shows the error in red, so it looks more like an error. And that's it. The only problem here is that we are not uh, generating any error in here. Everything goes smoothly here. So we also have to generate some error if we really want to catch that error. And for example, we can generate an error like this. We can say la la la, which if I write it like this, it's, it's a variable that I'm using and it was never declared before. So this will generate an error. Let's try. Uh, I'm going to... I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to say la 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 here, and I'm going to try this function. But this function uses prompt, so I have to use it on the browser. That's way too big. Okay, so now I'm going to calculate age. Hey there, what's your name? This is the first thing that happens before the la la la. And I will say, my name is Anthony. And I'll say OK, but then after I got the name and the name is fine, is correct, so I'm not returning abruptly, I'm going to go into the la la la, which is going to generate an error, most probably. So what you will see is that the function will stop there. It will not continue asking my age. Instead, it's going to jump to the catch and it's going to console log to, to console error the error. Let's see if it works. OK. Here it is, reference error, la la la, is not defined. So, as imagined, uh, we are not continuing with the function, we are stopping there, and we are catching the error and using it the way we want to. For example, in this case, we are writing the, uh, the error in red, and it's also, it also provides some uh, extra details if you really want to see them and if you are able to understand them but we don't really care too much about this right now, okay? So, catching error is actually convenient because you don't need to put multiple ifs here. You don't have to catch in advance. If la 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 is defined, then continue, otherwise uh, just uh, return abruptly. Uh, we can go on with our code and if there are any runtime errors, these are called runtime errors because they are errors that are only caught at runtime, not at design time, not while you're programming. Everything seems fine until you run the code. And when you run the code, you get an error. <laughs> this is actually an error that, as you can see, ESLint is already catching. ESLint is a, a very helpful tool that allows you to prevent some of those runtime errors. This is not an error in JavaScript. You have used a, uh, a variable that was never defined before, but this is not a problem while you're typing your code. It's a problem while you're running your code. So that's why JavaScript will never complain for such a thing. But ESLint is giving you a heck ex an extra help in telling you, hey, this will probably cause some errors. So maybe you want to declare the variable or just remove it right away. Or maybe you were you meant another variable name. Maybe you want to say not name, which was defined. Oh, yes, of course. Okay. And yeah, this is how you try. Okay, let's, yeah. Try catch only works for runtime errors. That's fine. Uh, try catch works synchronously. We don't really care too much about this. What you catch here is the error object. So there is a special object, which is called error which is useful because it contains everything that you need to understand the error. The error usually has a name. For example, this error that we triggered here is called a reference error. And it's a kind of error. It's the name of this specific error. The error talks about a reference to a variable that doesn't exist. It has a message which usually is a human readable message, like la 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 is not defined. And, oh, come on. And it also has a stack. What is a stack? You already know what is a stack, but you also know what is a current call stack. In fact, you know that functions are accumulated inside of a call stack 
and then once you reach the top of the call stack they are invoked one by one and when you get an error it will show you the list of all the invocations of all the functions that invoked other functions that evoked other functions so you will be e more able to locate where the problem was originated in the first place so the call stack is usually pretty interesting and pretty important to understand what happened in your code why the code originated so instead of console log the error you can console log the error name and then also the message and also the stack which is exactly the same thing you just show them one by one instead of having them shown all at the same time let's see if this works name is still Anthony never change it so now the name of the error is reference error the message is lala is not defined and the stack is actually all of it <laughs> reference error lala is not defined in the function called calculate age in the function anonymous which is a function that is provided automatically to you by the developer tools of chrome and that's it for try catch uh let's continue after the break okay see you in five minutes if i'm able to stop this thing here bye see you in five minutes oh wait i'm a second i was stopping the stream see you in five minutes bye
a few moments later. Back again! Hi! I hope you had a nice coffee. I did. So we can continue with try and catch. Um, what else? What else? What else? Yeah, we can catch without even specifying the error, with no parentheses at all. Uh, and this is only if you really don't care about the error itself, if you don't want to do anything with the error. You just want to uh, say, I don't know, console log an error occurred, for example. But why should you? It's much better to always get a reference to the error so you can uh, use it somewhere. Um, Okay, using try catch, let's explore a real life use case of try catch. Let's see, they use JSON parse. JSON parse is one of those methods that generate pretty easily an error, uh, especially if your JSON that you're trying to parse is the JSON string has any errors inside of it. So I see here that the JSON is well formed. In fact, I've got open and close curly braces and in, inside i've got two properties key value pairs the name of those properties are always in double quotes which is good the value of the first property is in double quotes good the second property value is not in double quotes so it's a number but it's fine and those are separated by a comma so this is a valid json string and in fact if i do json parse.json i got a user which is uh, a valid JavaScript object to which I can ask the name and the age. But what if JSON is malformed? Well, in that case, JSON parse will generate an error. For example, this one here is a bad JSON string. It, it makes no sense. So if I try to do JSON parse of that JSON, it will generate an error. Let's try it out ourselves. Because why just read things? JSON.parse Hello world This is me Etc, etc um, This has an uncaught syntax error Unexpected token Oh, I said hell world Hell uh, Token edge in JSON at position 0 so this is not a valid JSON string and uh, the error was uncaught. But what if I say try to parse this thing? JSON.parse, let's say heaven world, since we talked about hell. And if there's an error, then I'm going to console log the error as it is. I don't know. Okay, as you can see, now it's a syntax error, but it's not an uncaught syntax error because it was actually caught, right? Uh, I have a syntax error, it was caught, and it was logged on the console. So now the error is actually managed in the proper way. And what else? We can also throw our own errors. We cannot just catch errors thrown by someone else. How are we able to throw our own errors? Well, there's an operator called throw. And throw allows you to throw anything, actually. As far as I know, you can throw a string, you can throw a number, you can throw null, but the best thing you can throw is an error. So you can create a new error like this, new error given, usually you put a message, and or you can use one of those uh, classes that extend the base error class, like syntax error, reference error, type error, etc. Et this is very, very important in Java, C Sharp, and other statically typed languages. You want to exactly define the type of error that you generated. But in JavaScript, type is not that important. And if I have to throw an error, I usually throw a generic error. I don't even care about syntax error or even creating my own errors. I, I just don't care. I just throw an error and the nature of that error will probably be uh, written inside of the message or will be uh, deductible from the stack trace. 
And that's it. So here, instead of uh, returning a string, I can instead throw... Yeah, I can throw the string itself. This is fine. And we can even check how it works. Let's say if I just want to throw that string instead of returning, uh, or instead of throwing an error. What happens in this case? I'm going to try it out. Calculate the age. Now, the error should occur as soon as I write an improper name. So, for example, when I press ESC, because this will provide a null value for the name. And in that case, it will throw, hey, what kind of name is that? And probably the thing that is being thrown will be caught here. And I don't know what happens here, because error in that case should be just a string. It should not be an object. So maybe this will also get, generate an error. Let's see. Yep, an error occurred and then undefined, undefined and undefined. Because what was thrown was a string. So what I call here an error is actually a string. And the string has no name, no message and no stack. I could have just console logged the string itself. And I would have seen this, hey, what kind of name is that? Bobby says, can you throw a void or would just be undefined as usual? Void is a term that we do not have in JavaScript. Uh, but you can throw null, you can throw undefined. Uh, are you saying, can you throw and that's it? Apparently not. You cannot just throw, just like you would return. You have to throw something. And if you have to throw something, it's much better to throw an error. So you can say, throw new, new error with the message as the parameter. We can do exactly the same here. And now we are dealing all with try catches. Let's see, calculate age. So, what's your name? Press ESC. Error! Hey, what kind of name is that? And I have all these, uh, all these uh, console errors because I did it like this. Console log an error occurred, and this is what we see here. And then console error of name, message, and also stack. So now we are able to throw our own errors and also to catch them inside of this error, inside of this catch block. Um, okay, let's continue. Then I don't know if I want to tell you a little, some of the good practices right now or later on. You can throw other errors, other kinds of errors, like syntax error for when you're JSON parsing, but otherwise you can just throw an error. You can re-throw things. What does this mean? Well, you can even say, hey, you know what? I don't care about catching the error in this function. I want this error to be caught by someone else, by someone who catches the calculate age function. So in that case, you can just avoid the try catch. So you're just throwing the error and whoever invokes calculate age will have to add their own try catch block in order to catch any runtime errors. So you don't need to try catch every single time. Or you can rethrow, which means that you can try catch, but in the catch, you can throw another error. Something went wrong. Something like this. So you can catch an error and rethrow an error, which is a, maybe a cumulative error, an error that um, generalizes that something went wrong while calculating the age, for example. Um, here I was uh, missing an of or a a. Sorry for that. I don't want to butcher English. And as you can see here, since errors are classes, uh, you can even use the instance of operator, which should, you should never use. However, just don't use it. It's not really that important. Uh, I think that's it for the basic syntax. I don't think there's much to say. If you see here, uh, that, that's rethrowing because if you are invoking blah 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 which generates an error because this function was never defined 
you can say if the error was something like syntax error, then throw it's not a syntax error, I'm sorry, then rethrow the error itself. And outside of that function, you can trap this read data into a try cache block and you can do whatever you want with that error. That's it. There's an addition in the JavaScript language, which was a long awaited addition since every other language had it already. In Instead of just try catch, you can also add a finally block here. The finally block will be executed if the try block succeeds or if the try block doesn't succeed and it goes into a catch. So the finally block will always be invoked at the end of the try or at the end of the catch. And this is usually very useful when you're doing something like for example, a connection to the database. If you want to connect to a database, you have to open a connection. Then you have to perform operations on that uh, using that connection. Those operations could fail. And if those operations fail, you catch the error and you do something. For example, you roll back the operation that you were trying to do. But then at the end of the operation, if it was successful or if it was not successful, you always want to, for example, close the connection to the database. And this is something that you usually do in the finally block. So you open a connection, you perform operations. If you don't care if the operations were successful or not, but at the end, you must close the connection. Otherwise you will have a dangling connection that could give you problems. So you always open the connection and close the connection. Just like you open a window, but you also have to close the window, of course. So now we've got this finally block, which is useful. I don't really care to show you examples. These are things that you will find by yourselves while you're writing your own code or you're working with uh, some seniors. Uh, so let's not care too much about this. Uh, Catching errors and throwing errors is important, but not as junior developers. Don't worry about too much about that, okay? Uh, so, yeah, I don't know if there's anything... No, custom errors. Uh, there's another thing that I wanted to tell you is that there's a good practice that says that usually you should only have one try-catch block in every function. And usually... This try catch block should wrap the whole function. Sometimes you don't do this. Sometimes you say, I don't know, let name. And then in the try block, you say name is prompt, blah, blah, blah. You open the connection outside of the try block and then you perform operations with that connections in the try block. And that's fine. But usually a best practice is to wrap everything inside of the try, the try catch block because this is uh, just more predictable. And another thing that people do is to use different try catches. So you can do uh, try and catch an error and then try another thing and catch an error. But again, this is not really that useful. If you need to have two try catch blocks, well, maybe you could put those two try catch blocks in their own separate functions which contain each one their own try catch block at the topmost level. So as soon as you see that you need to create two try catches or to put something outside of the try catch block, try instead to create other functions, other support functions that allow you to apply this best practice, which is all about wrapping all of your code in one single try catch block at the top level of your function. That's it. This is uh, one of those best practices that you can learn when you read a book called Clean Code by Uncle Bob, Robert Martin. And I really encourage you to read this book because it's uh, a very good book which allows you to learn the secrets of writing not just code that works, but good code. Um, in Java, C Sharp, etc., you sometimes want to extend the error class and defining your own custom errors like HTTP error, not found error, database error, etc., etc. And you can do the same in JavaScript since you now know 
what a class is. You can create a class called validation error, which extends error, and you're going to do anything you want with that. But personally, at least in the JavaScript world, I never needed to do this thing. If you need to do this thing, it's probably because you're not creating an application. It's probably because you're creating a library. And in libraries, you want to provide the best user experience to the users of your library. So you want to specify the best, uh, the, the, to convey messages in the best way. So in that case, it could be possible that you want to create custom errors that uh, allow the programmer to understand better what was the problem. But I usually don't create these kinds of errors in JavaScript at least. In Java and C Sharp I do them, but not in JavaScript. So yeah, you can just extend the, the basic error and create your own. Shall we go to more interesting stuff? Shall we go to promises and async await? This is one of the big bosses in JavaScript. We already, uh, um, we already confronted ourselves with some bosses like git branching, the for loop. What was another boss? Another thing that was pretty difficult to you guys. I don't even remember. Uh, something with functions. Yeah, you had problem with functions. Maybe the difference between function expressions, function declarations, arrow functions. And now we've got this. Yes, the show must go on. Okay. Inside my heart is breaking, but Miss Quackers is here for me. So let's go on. And let's do promises and async await. Okay, so there is a problem in JavaScript and you probably started understanding it last time when we dealt with set timeout and set intervals and set interval. This problem is strictly related to callback functions. What is callback functions? A callback function is a function that it is called back. Uh, so let's call it promises. A callback function is any function that is passed as parameter to another function, actually. So, for example, if I have, uh, well, if I use an array method like r dot for each, r dot for each, this for each function, as you know, accepts a callback function. In this case, it's an anonymous function, or it can be a an error function. Okay, whatever you want. This is a callback function. The problem with a callback function is that now we've got an element. And with the elements, I can have a look at, I don't know, the properties of this element. How do I get the property values for the element? There was a method called object.values that, given the element, gives me an array of all the values that are inside of this object. And I can do another for each. And inside of this for each, there's a callback function. And inside of this callback function, if the value is uh, an object or an array, let's say that this value is an array, I can do another for each. Uh, I'll call it item, etc., etc., etc. So what I'm doing here is showing you what is usually considered a callback hell. And this time it's hell. Callback hell means that you have callbacks which invoke other callbacks, which invoke other callbacks, etc, etc. And this happens a lot, especially when you're using asynchronous functions like set interval, because set interval accepts a callback function, which gets executed every n milliseconds, for example, a thousand milliseconds. And in set interval, I can do something like uh, perform I'm, I'm writing pseudocode now, uh, perform HTTP request, okay? I'm performing an HTTP request, but this is an asynchronous function. I don't, I know where it starts, I know when it starts, but I don't know when it stops. I'm performing the HTTP request, but I have no idea when the server will respond to me. So that's why this kind of functions is usually an asynchronous function, which means that it relies on a callback 
that as soon as I receive the response from the HTTP server, then I will be able to process that response. And what do I do with that response? Maybe I can wait a little bit. I will wait a couple of seconds. And then I will do something. For example, I can uh, uh, get the ID from that response if there's an ID. So const ID is response.id. And with that ID, I can perform another HTTP request given the ID. But the problem is that this other request is another asynchronous function. Uh, you know what? I, it's not an HTTP request. It's, uh, I don't know, retrieve from database. Oh, come on. Database. So retrieving things from databases is another kind of asynchronous request because you open a connection to the database, but the, the database could be not available, could respond with a sort of delay. So you, you know when you start the, the request, but you don't know when it stops. So you cannot just say, hey, uh, const data is equal to retrieve from database. You cannot do such a thing because this would be synchronous. You retrieve the data from the database and you know exactly that on line 13, as soon as you start doing this request, you will have the response. It's usually not like this. Usually you don't know when this request will be actually performed, so you have to provide a callback function that given the data that will be retrieved at a certain point will allow you to do, I don't know, a console log of that data. Okay, I'm writing a lot of pseudocode which is meant to show you how in the world of asynchronous calls we incur into the so-called callback hell. A callback hell is a hell in which we have callbacks invoking other callbacks, invoking other callbacks, which makes our code look like Hadouken. This is callback hell. Look at that. I want to show the image a little bigger. Here it is. So you can load the link. And then once you get the link, you can load another link, and then you can load another link, and then you can load a link, etc., etc. And all of this stuff is a callback hell. It's very, very difficult to read, very difficult to write, very difficult to manage, to change. What if you want to change the order in which those callbacks are executed, etc., etc.? So it's awful to load those links one by one, one after the other, this way. And another thing that is very difficult to achieve is to maybe perform two asynchronous requests in parallel and then get the results back uh, at the same time. So doing parallel requests instead of uh, having all those uh, asynchronous functions being in executed one after the other. In this scenario, every load link has to wait for the previous load links to be executed or to, 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 to have a return. Instead, if those are, are not strictly related to each other, maybe I could probably uh, invoke all those load links in parallel and get those results all together at the same time. And this is not easy to achieve with just callbacks. So this is what we want to avoid. And as you can imagine, this is very, very similar to the problem that we faced last, last Saturday. In the, during the Easter special, when we were talking about composing even synchronous functions, because when we compose synchronous functions this way, we have something similar to a callback hell. We've got a console log of to HTML, of add exclamation, of shout, of hello world. And this is pretty Hadouken style. Instead, through the use of functional programming, we were able, well, not even with functional programming, just this way, we were able with, um, with an extra variable that changes value every single line, we were able to flatten out this code. And with function composition, we were able to do 
a very similar thing, but also to be, we were able to compose those functions in uh, different ways and in even unpredictable ways. With callback hell, we have a similar situation. We don't want to have these callbacks being invoked one inside of the other. We want to flatten out these calls and we want to see something like do this, take your time, I don't care, I can wait. But then once you finished, do that on a new line and take your time for that too. But once you finished, then please do also that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We want to have this kind of asynchronous behavior being flattened out and look more like a synchronous, a synchronous series of steps that we want to take. In order to achieve this, we have a cool construct which is called promises. Uh, here they are telling you exactly the same. You see the callback hell, load script, then load another script, then load another script, etc, etc. Handling errors is... Uh, I don't really care too much about handling errors, but usually we have uh, callback functions that are uh, passed as error and script. So in this example, if you want to really read it, uh, they, they are declaring a function called load script. And this function is created by the tutorial itself. It's this one here, load script src callback, which is going to load a script from the server. And it has a callback function, which has two parameters. One is the error, if any, and one is the script that was loaded if there were not, no errors at all. Uh, but as you can see, they are talking about a pyramid of doom because if we want to get uh, the, uh, any optional errors that come up from load script, you have to say something like load script and if error, then handle the error. Otherwise, you can load the other script. And if there's an error in this other script, you have to handle that error. Otherwise, you can continue with the other script, etc, etc, etc. This is a mixture of callback hell plus Hadouken code made with if-else cascades, and it's Doom. It, it, we don't like it. Well, I like Doom as a game, but not as programming. So here is the callback hell or the pyramid of Doom. This is not what we want. That's why we're going to look at promises. Promise is a, a concept that once you understand it, it's very, very easy to use, very easy to read, very easy to grasp. But at first it can overwhelm you a little bit. So we'll try to slow down a little bit. If you come from another programming language such as Java, I think that in Java they are called futures. Uh, but nowadays we call those promises in uh, almost any language, I think. So how I explain it is like this. I know that, for example, perform HTTP request is an asynchronous function. But what if instead of passing a callback function, what if I return immediately something? This something is some sort of uh, certificate that, yes, okay, I got your request and I will try as soon as I can to perform that request. But for now, I will return you immediately something. I will return you a promise that I will do it. I'm not doing it right now, but I promise immediately that I will do it. So instead of having a perform HTTP request function that accepts a callback function, I can have a perform HTTP request function that instead returns immediately something. And it's a promise. The promise is a special kind of object. And it's a project and it's an object that has one method, very important method. It's called then. Promise then. And this method accepts the callback function that you already know. Response, blah, blah, blah. So right now, if you compare the callback version and the non-callback version, the only difference here is that perform HTTP rec request first accepted a callback function 
Now it doesn't accept a callback function, but it returns an object to which I can attach the same callback function. And I can attach it to this then method. Well, promise also has another method, if you really want to know, which is called catch. And catch is able to append a callback function that will be invoked if there is an error, just like with try-catch handling. And I think that in recent additions, we even have promise.finally. But I want to be sure. So let's um, let's just look around. Promise finally. Is there is there a promise finally? Yes, there is. Promise finally with a callback function inside. So yeah, I was right. Okay, so we are starting to delegate the invocation of callback functions not to the current function perform HTTP request but to an object that is immediately returned from this function invocation. So far it doesn't seem to be that different from what we have. In fact if we use promises uh, like this they have really no clear advantage not at all. The only advantage that I would say is that, well, you don't even need to create this variable promise. You can chain those methods together because the perform HTTP request returns a promise. The then method of the promise also return a promise. And the catch method also returns a promise and finally returns the promise, probably. So if I want to, I can even rewrite this code like this. Instead of uh, returning the promise, I'm performing the request and then I'm invoking the response. But if there's a problem in the catch block, I'm catching the error. And finally, I can do whatever I need to do at the end. Uh, not really readable like this. I'm scrolling left and right. So let's put some... Uh, new lines here so it looks a little nicer okay here it works a little better so now I read it as perform the HTTP re request then once you have finished do this and if there's any error catch the error and do this and finally once you completed the request uh, successfully or unsuccessfully you do also this other thing here Maybe you have a connection and you close the connection, okay? So, <laughs> not really that useful, especially if you try now to do things one after the other. For example, uh, I'm performing the HTTP request and then, given the response, I want to retrieve the element from the database. So, how do I do this? If I was stupid, I would say, okay, in the then callback function in here, I could say, okay, now that I've got the response, I can get the ID from the response, and then I can do the same thing that I have here, retrieve from database given the ID, retrieve from database given the ID. But this time, instead of having a callback function that is invoked as soon as I've got the data, I can store the promise in a variable and then I can ask the promise to do then and then and, and catch and finally or I can do the same thing that I was doing right now so I can retrieve from database and then I can do whatever I want with the data that I retrieve from database and if there were any errors I can catch those errors and if nothing uh, at the end of it if nothing bad happened or if something bad happened, I don't care, I will do finally this. How is this different from the callback hell? Well, it's not. In fact, this is not the way you should use promises. Uh, here, I'm using promises just to delegate the callbacks 
to a separate object, the promise and the catch and the finally. The only thing that works better than before is the error handling. Because if you look at how the load script was uh, handling the errors, here errors were handled with an if-else cascade, which is pretty bad. With promises instead, you can handle the errors in their own catch. So this is already a little better because you don't need to put any ifs insta inside of your code. But this is not the only thing that we can do. A promise is so-called a thenable object because it's an object to which I can always invoke the then method. And the then method returns a promise, just like the catch method always returns a promise. I don't really know about the finally, because it's the final one, but probably the finally too returns a promise. What do I do with this information? Well, what I can do is this. Let's move these things outside. I don't care about them right now. I perform the HTTP request. Then, with the response, I can get the ID from the response and I can retrieve whatever I want from the database. But instead of attaching the then or storing the promise inside of a variable here, inside of this callback function here, I can return the promise that is going to be returned from this retrieve from database. The then method of perform HTTP request has a callback and this callback is returning a promise. If this thing is returning a promise, then I can attach a second then next to the previous then. Now, the promises, as you can see, are chainable. I can chain promises together, one after the other. And this is the power of promises. I will show you what I mean by that. Now that I have this then here, this then will get whatever is returned from this promise. And if I see how I was uh, designing this thing, it contains the data that was retrieved from the database. And then I can also catch any error that occurred in between, or I can do a finally block. I don't even need those three methods here, methods here, then catch and finally. I can do this thing here, perform the HTTP request, then do another thing, making sure that you return a promise for the next block in the chain, then do another thing, then do another thing, and another, and another, and another, and if anything happens wrong in one of those promises, you can catch the error, any one of those errors, and you can catch it here. And finally, if all the promises succeeded, or if there was an error, I don't care, I'm going to, for example, close the connection. So as you can see, using promises allows me to write my code in a, in a way that is similar to the usual way, the usual synchronous way. It's like I'm wrapping everything into a try-catch block. I'm doing this, and then I'm doing this, and then I'm doing this, if anything wrong happens, I'm catching the error. And then I also have a finally, not funally, funally. And then finally, I can do something like, I don't know, ended. Or the end. Uh, and I do this in with a syntax that is using still callback functions. But these callback functions are triggered one after the other, wrapped inside of those then methods. So do this, then do that, then do this other thing, catch an error, potential error, and finally do something. And you do this with method chaining. This is all a chain of methods, which is very, very similar to the chain of methods that we already knew, know from array methods. Array.filter.map Dot reduce. It's very similar to this thing here. That's why I was insisting so much on array methods. If you understand array methods, then probably promises are not that difficult or new to you. You start with an object 
you ask this object to do something and this will return an object with the same shape. In this case, this was an array that is returned every single time. So you can chain other methods to this object. In this case, the object is a promise. So perform HTTP request returns a promise. And so you can ask the promise to do a then, which will return a promise, to which you can ask another then, to which you can ask a catch, to which you can ask a finally. Make sense? Please let me know if this is too, too complicated. I will show you still what they say in the tutorial. Maybe they give another way. No, it's fine. Oh, really? Oh, cool. Okay, so let's see. They say, imagine that you're a top singer and fans ask day and night for your upcoming song. To get some relief, you promise to send it to them when it's published. You give your fans a list. They can fill in their email addresses so that when the song becomes available, all subscribed parties instantly receive it. And even if something goes very, very wrong, say a fire in the studio so that you can publish the song, they will still be notified. Everyone is happy, you because the people don't crowd you anymore, and fans because they won't miss the song. This is a real-life analogy for things we often have in programming. A producing code that does something and takes time, for instance some code that loads the data over a network, that's a singer, and a consuming code that wants the result of the producing code once it's ready. Many functions may need that result, these are the fans. A promise is a special JavaScript object that links the producing code and the consuming code together. In terms of our analogy, this is the subscription list. The, sub the producing code takes whatever time it needs to produce the promised result, and the promise makes that result available to all the subscribed code when it's ready. I actually don't like this analogy, and I don't like... Okay, the, the analogy isn't terribly accurate. Uh, no, I don't really like this analogy. You know what? Uh, you know why? Because this looks like a description of the so-called observer pattern, which is one of those patterns that you can find in the Gango 4 book design patterns. Observer pattern. And we probably even mentioned uh, something similar when we talked about event listeners. Because it's exactly this. An event listener is some function that subscribes to an event. You don't know when the event occurs, but every single time that that event occurs, then the listener will be notified and will react. It, we have this callback function which will be invoked every single time the event is triggered. So we've got in the observer pattern these two concepts of a subject and the observer of that subject. The subject triggers some events and the observer listens to those events and reacts accordingly. Promises can look like uh, something similar, but the problem with promises is that they fire just once. They are not firing multiple times. And that's why there are some libraries such as RxJS by Microsoft, which instead try to create the real observer pattern in pure JavaScript. So RxJS has this concept of a subject, of an observer, observer, even the observable, which is similar to a subject, but a subject is uh, more than that. And this library uses a lot functional programming. It uses uh, concepts that are very similar to the array methods that we saw and very similar to the promises that we are seeing right now, but they do a lot more than that. Uh, we, they talk about pure functions, which is uh, a very important concept in functional programming. So that's one reason why I'm stressing so much on functional programming. Not, it's, not only is it's nice, it's simpler, etc. but many libraries out there are starting to use it quite a lot. So you have to understand these fundamentals to understand those uh, libraries. Personally, I don't like RxJS too much. I just like the logo because it looks like an uh, Ouroboros dragon. Uh, but I don't use RxJS in my daily coding. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it could be very useful to solve very difficult problems related to asynchronous 
invocations but my problems are usually much simpler than that so i don't want to uh we say shoot at a fly with a cannon i don't want to solve a small problem with a complex solution i want to do exactly the opposite so that's why i usually don't use rxjs but rxjs is the implementation in javascript of the observer pattern so you don't have to implement it yourself promises are simpler than that and i don't think that we should talk about this as the singer and uh, the fans that are notified it's fine if you say that the singer will notify only once of their on their upcoming uh song in that case yes that's fine a promise is an object that is pretty easy to create uh, if you want to create a promise you can say something like this const promise is equal to a new promise the promise itself requires uh, a callback function and this callback function which i'm writing as an arrow function because i like them better but you can also write it as an anonymous function it's a strange function because it has two parameters and those two parameters are references to other functions like resolve and reject these are usually called like this you can call them as you wish of course because these are just parameters of a function but historically we usually call them resolve and reject resolve is a function that i want to invoke as soon as i am certain that the request was successfully fulfilled and reject is a function that i want to invoke inside of this promise once i know that there were problems with the invocation <clears throat> so for example if i want to do a um, set timeout that uses uh, promises set timeout is not using promises because set timeout as you can see accepts two parameters one is the callback function and one is the timeout it's the time that we have to wait before issuing uh, uh, invoking this anonymous function but i can convert the set timeout into the world of promises pretty easily I can create a promise, I can do a set timeout here inside of this function, I can wait for let's say two, two seconds, but in the anonymous function, wait a second I'm mistyping, okay, but in the anonymous function instead of just uh, console log, return, etc, etc, I can invoke resolve, let's say 42. I resolve, I invoke this function, resolve, with whatever I want to expose, return from this promise. If there are any errors, let's say, well, I don't know, I cannot generate errors like this because this is a, too simple as a, as a problem, but I can reject with a nope or with an error. I can also reject with a new error. Nope. If I remember correctly, wh whatever I reject will automatically be wrapped inside of an error, but I'm not really, really sure about that. So let's not give it for granted right now. Uh, shall we try? Let's, let's try this promise on the browser uh, or even on Node if I want to, but well, the browser is better because it's uh, easier to change my code. So I'm creating a promise as a new promise. The promise needs a callback function. This callback function needs at least one of these two uh, function references, resolve and reject. And as soon as I feel confident, I can resolve. I can resolve immediately like this, or I can resolve after some time out. I don't care. Uh, the promise will be fulfilled as soon as the resolve function is invoked. And it will be rejected as soon as the reject function is invoked, which is not the case right now because we are never rejecting. So let's try the promise here. This is my promise. Const promise is equal to a new promise that uses resolves and reject. And after a timeout of two seconds, 2000 milliseconds, it's going to resolve with a 42. So now I'm, this is my promise. 
and now I can see that the, if I inspect the promise, the promise is an object of type promise and it's already fulfilled. The promise, well, two seconds have passed already. So the promise started, it was in some sort of pending mode for two seconds. And then after two seconds, the promise was fulfilled and it gave me 42. But if I look at the promise, the promise itself is holding the value of 42. Instead of a strange property, promise results with, the, with those square brackets. I should actually uh, use that value with the then method. Remember, promise then, and then we've got a callback function that accepts whatever was passed inside of the resolve function. So if I resolve with 42, I can create a callback function that accepts the value, and this value will be the 42. So it depends a lot on how you build the promise. The value that you have here is whatever was passed in the result function. So here, for example, I can console log the value itself. And the promise is actually returning 42. I console logged 42. What was returned was, again, the promise. And as you can see, this is not the same promise as before. This is a promise that is being fulfilled and the value that it holds is undefined. Why is it undefined? Well, because in this callback function here, we are console logging something and we are returning nothing. So as I told you, every invocation of the then method is going to return a new promise. And the promise will hold whatever value was returned from inside of this function, of this anonymous function, this callback function. Here, we are not returning anything. So that's why we are, we are seeing nothing. But if I want to, I can, uh, I don't know, I can console log the value. Like the, oh, come on. No, I lost it. <laughs> it's too difficult to write it here. I, I'll write it here. Uh, so I'm going to say promise then. I wanted to print the value. And I want to console log the value. Given the value, I want to console log the value. And then maybe I want to return something like uh, yay. If I'm returning something, then the then method here will actually produce another promise that will hold the yay string inside of it so I can chain once again that value which is now yay and I can console log that value too. But before that I'm going to try it as it is. So don't worry I'm going to very fast but I'm going to explain everything back again. So I'm creating a promise. This promise is created as new promise given a callback function and this callback function usually has the resolve and reject references, uh, variables that are, well, parameters that are references to functions. The resolve function can be invoked even immediately if I want to, or I can wait for a timeout, for, uh, like in this case. I wait for two seconds, and then after two seconds, I invoke resolve given a value, let's say 42. The value 42 will be provided in the callback function of the promise as soon as I start doing promise.then. Promise.then value, it will log the value and it will return yay for some reason. When I return yay, then the then method of this promise will actually return a new promise. And this promise will be able to consume this yay string inside of, uh, of its callback function. So I'm invoking this, this stuff here. The promise was pending. And now the promise, if I inspect it again, is actually fulfilled with a value of 42. So as you can see, when I declare this promise, the, thing, the first thing that I get is a pending promise. And then I can also inspect the promise that I had before and it's fulfilled with a value of 42. So promise.then is actually going to give me another promise. This promise here that is pending is a promise that, well, it was pending, but then it was fulfilled and it contains yay. Pretty difficult to understand, maybe, because now we've got the yay promise before the fulfilled 
42 promise. I hope it makes still sense to you. Uh, we've got a promise. And the first thing that I see is that the promise is immediately returned from this. I cannot see it like this. Okay, let's let's do it step by step. Sorry, guys, for the... It's actually pretty difficult to, 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 to explain it. Okay, let's, let's try again. Const promise, I invoke this thing, and the promise that I have is a promise that was pending for the first two seconds, but then now it's fulfilled with 42. Okay, that's fine for that, for now. Then, promise then, this is going to create another promise that because the then method always returns a promise so promise then i'm going to consume the value 42 but then i'm going to return yay which is going to give me another promise i can store it uh, i can call it another promise okay another promise is the result of invoking promise then now I see the 42 because this is what I wanted to console log, but then I want to inspect the another promise and another promise is a promise that is fulfilled and it contains the value of yay. So I can declare a promise, I can declare another promise as the result of invoking that other promise or as I already showed you, I can even chain them together just like I did here. I don't even need to declare those promises. I can even say new promise with resolve reject. I know that this will return a promise. So after that, just do this other thing and then do another thing like given the message, uh, console log the message. Okay, I'm chaining those promises one after the other without even using the keyword promise, uh, except for, of course, the um, creation of that promise. But I'm not using a variable called promise or another promise. I can just chain those promises together like this. Okay, new promise, then given the value, console log the value and return yay. And then given the message, console log the message and don't return anything at all. So at the end, of it, I will probably see undefined. The promise was pending, but then it was fulfilled, and after two seconds, I saw 42, and then I saw yay. And all of this in some sort of a stream of information that starts with a promise and then continues and continues and continues. This way of writing things is very similar to what we did with number arrays. It's strictly related to functional programming and it's so convenient that even class-based programming languages such as Java started incorporating this behavior in their own language. In fact, a language like Java has now the concept of stream. Starting from Java 8, they do have this concept of stream and I don't care if you really don't understand this code, but look at that, widget.stream.filter with some sort of arrow function that doesn't use a fat arrow, it uses a thin arrow. If I remember correctly, this in Java is called a lambda. Then map to int and then sum. You see how this is similar to what we did in JavaScript? This is the new way we also write code in Java. So it's not just classes, it's not just object-oriented programming, but now with Java, using the stream construct, we can turn our things into streams of data that are processed with method chaining. This is part of the JavaScript language and has been part of the JavaScript language for a, a long time. Promises are actually not really that new. They were introduced from JavaScript 6, I think. Before promises, uh, you could still use promises, but those promises were not part of the language and they were instead provided by some libraries. For example, the first library that provided promises, as far as I know, was jQuery. 
The problem, however, with jQuery is that they started with a non-standard way of creating promises. They were called deferred instead of promise, and they behaved slightly differently. Then they created this concept of promise, which instead works almost exactly the same. Uh, as you can see, not completely. In fact, if I use a promise in jQuery, there's no then, there's done, which is exactly the same thing, almost exactly the same thing. So we don't really care too much about the syntax. jQuery was one of the first ones that uh, introduced promises. And then we got uh, Lodash, then we got, uh, I think, Bluebird, other libraries, and now we can just remove all those libraries if we really want promises because we have promises as part of the language and they are standard. Hey, we've got a new one, according to Bo. Do you have to import all uh, asterisks from honesty for promises to be reliable? I like this thing. <laughs> Love it. Uh, no, apparently not. Uh, promises are always reliable. They got your back, but I like the pun. Awesome. Thanks a lot for sharing. Okay, so let's go back to promises. So uh, if you are understanding these promises at the first try, it means that I did a great job in the past and you too, because you actually understood all the stuff about array methods and functional programming. And now this stuff is not really that difficult to you. Sometimes I happen to have to uh, explain these concepts in the same day in which I explained array methods and functional programming. And it was really, really difficult for my students to grasp all of this information at the same time. So that's why we're doing this course every week. So you have the time to process and to practice on things before moving on. So when we create a promise, the promise starts with a state of pending and with no result. And then the promise could branch out and be resolved. So its state will be fulfilled and it will return a value or the promise could be rejected with an error. So the state of the promise will be rejected and it will have an error. Let's create a promise that gives me an error. Pretty easy. I can just copy the exact code that I had before. And instead of resolving, I'm going to reject. The promise was pending, but after two seconds, ooh, I've got an uncaught error. And the uncaught error is giving me 42 because this is what I got, uh, I passed to the reject function. So if I create a new promise like this one, I can catch the error and I can console log that error, which probably is just uh, the number 42. Promise is pending. And after two seconds, I see 42. So I made a false assumption before. I said that when you reject, whatever value you pass will be automatically wrapped inside of an error. Nope, not true. If you want an error instead of 42, you have to explicitly say, hey, I want a new error whose message is 42. In that case, you are going to actually reject with a new error. The promise is pending, but after two seconds, this is what we have. We've got an error with a message of 42. Okay, so not really that difficult. Uh, seems nice, but there's more to it. I don't know if the tutorial is going to tell us immediately about the other goodies. Are you recording this or just teaching live? I am also recording this and I'm putting everything on YouTube. In fact, if you have a look at my a channel which is called Inglorious Coders. Uh, yep. I do have a playlist in which I'm uploading all of my lessons. So if you want to catch some previous lessons, you can. Uh, only the less only the Saturday lessons, however. I'm not recording. Uh, I am recording, but I'm not uploading my Wednesday practice because I don't think it's worth it. Uh, I think it's much more, much worth it, uh, just the, the lessons. And if you want to be part of the community, you can join the Discord server called Inglorious Gooders. 
for which I'm passing you the invitation link. So I never understand how to create an, a link that never expires. I always have to create a new link every single time. Here it is if you want to be part of the community and share your problems, your solutions. We are also going to share, your, we are sharing job, uh, application, job postings too. I've got some companies that need some skilled developers. That's why I'm here. I want to build the offer for my clients and I want you guys to succeed. If you lost your job due to the pandemic, if you uh, want to uh, renovate yourself and try uh, to acquire a new skill and make it profitable, that's why we're here. So I would really, really like to bridge the gap between those companies that really need someone highly skilled in programming, not just an improvised person that was uh, self-learning the bad way. I want you guys to learn the right way to become super powered developers and make companies happy with your work and with your skills. Okay. Let's go back to business. So uh, as for promises, yeah, we can resolve, we can reject. And that's it. Is there anything else that we should see? Okay, yeah, we've got the then a catch and finally. There's also another way we can catch errors, but I think we, we should never do this. Promise then actually accepts two functions as callback. One is the callback in case of success. And the second one is a callback in, in case of error. But I wouldn't use this like this. Uh, since we have the catch method, it's much probably much better to use the catch method instead of passing two callbacks inside of the then method. Okay? So let's just not use this. Nah. Nah, no, come on. Yeah, the catch is much better. The promise is able to catch. And in that case, it can alert or do whatever you want. Look at how they are using a reference to the alert function. This should also be not really that new to you, since we already saw how to use functions as first class citizens in JavaScript. For example, in this case, then given the message, console log the message. Okay, but this is an anonymous function that just invokes console log with the same parameter that it received. So as we already saw multiple times, we can short circuit this anonymous function. And instead of creating an anonymous function that invokes console log, we can just pass a reference to console log. And this behaves almost exactly the same. What if I want to do something other than alert, but in the same way? Uh, I don't know if this answered your question. Yeah, like that, but what about a function that I wrote? Okay, uh, same. Uh, so, if I have a message, and this message is going to be consumed, like console log the message, and do something else, I don't know, uh, maybe console the message, but with three exclamation marks. Okay, you, you can do whatever you want. So, this is an anonymous function. Why don't I give a name? I can provide a name to this anonymous function. I want to transform it into a function declaration, such as function handle message, which, given the message, is going to console log message, but with three exclamation marks. This function now has a name, and so I can reference it by name, handle message. And that's it. This is the thing that we did in the past lessons multiple, multiple times, especially when looking at number arrays. Uh, this exercise that I showed a couple of weeks ago, maybe even more, was an example on how we can use functions, small functions, even one-liner functions, as building blocks that can be used as references to build things together. In this case, we're given the array, we are filtering the array given the isEven function reference, and then we are squaring all the elements with the reference to the square function, and then we are reducing all the elements to their sum by passing a reference to the sum function. Of course, we can define the anonymous function right in here. Oh, come on, what is this? A plus B. 
But instead of doing this and having a one-shot anonymous function that we create and then we fire and forget, we can instead declare this function elsewhere, like sum given n1 and n2 is n1 plus n2, and then we just pass a reference to that function without parentheses, because otherwise we're passing the result of invoking that function. We don't want to pass the invocation of that function, we just want to, to pass the reference to that function, which makes a lot of sense until you do currying. In fact, during the Easter special last Saturday, we saw how through currying you can create functions that return other functions. And in that case, sometimes instead of just a reference to a function, you see being passed the invocation of a function. But that's just because invoking this function is not going to provide you a value, it's going to provide you a reference to a function. So in that case, yes, there is a reason why we are invoking this function, because this is a higher order function. It's a curried fine function, a curried function, which returns a function. Uh, I know it's a mouthful, especially for those of you who haven't uh, s watched any of my previous streams, but uh, I hope it makes sense if you go back and, uh, and watch my other streams or if you already know this kind of stuff. Okay, <clears throat> then we've got the finally, we already told about this, and the example load script is going to change the callback based version of load script into a promise based load script. And as you can see, the only difference from the previous to the, the, to the other one is that here all the code is going to be wrapped inside of a new promise, which is going to be returned immediately. The promise is returned immediately, but the promise uses resolve and reject, which will be invoked as soon as something happens, as soon as a timeout has uh, finished, or as soon as an event is triggered. And that's it. Um, according to Bo, can you do something like that, even if the promise uh, whatever returns an object, but the thing you want to pass forward is a certain thing on that object and not the whole object? So you want to uh, somehow filter out the elements that you ha have on the object? Yes, you can. Um, yeah, sure. So if I have, I don't know, if I have an object which is myself, Anthony, with an age of 38 at the time of writing, i.e. suppose return is foo bar, can you do the then handle message and somehow make it only perform the operation on foo, not the whole object? Yeah, okay, I've got the object, then I'm going to create a new promise that given the uh, callback which has the resolve and reject know that if i'm not using reject i can just avoid use, uh, declaring the reject i just want to resolve the object itself if i resolve the object itself in the then method the callback function will have the whole object and i can just console log the object but if I want to, I can resolve not just the object, not the whole object, I can resolve only the name of that object. And in that case, the then method will not have the object, it will have only the name of the object. So I hope that I'm answering to your question. This anonymous function can still be something like a function print name, that given a name is going to console log the name. And then I can use a reference to that print name in here. Okay, so yes, I can even filter out the properties of that object. I can do whatever I want, and I can do it either before resolving the promise, like in this case, or I can do it after resolving the promise. Let's say that here we are passing the whole object. Well, then in that case, the print name function will have the object passed as a parameter, but I can destructure it, and now I can use the name. Can you do it by resolving the whole object and then destructuring it then? That would be the same. Okay, I just answered your question. <laughs> You're speaking my mind. 
Oh yeah, like that. Yep. So yeah, you can even do like this. You can pass the whole object and then you can do whatever you want from the object. You can destructure it. You can say object.name uh, without destructuring or you can destructure it uh, right before const name is equal to object. Uh, this is a good rehearsal of uh, how destructuring works. And so you can use the name or as I like it, I usually destructure the properties from a parameter directly here. Not always, but usually I do this. And it's a syntax that's very common, especially in React, uh, the React framework. Thank you, teacher. Call me Anthony, please. Uh, thank you, according to Bo. Okay. So yeah, we wrap everything into a promise. We resolve whenever we want. We reject with an error if we really need to. And then load scripts, instead of accepting a callback function, doesn't accept anything else. Can we compromise on sensei? Okay, that's mine. I like it. Uh, the load script will return immediately a promise, and the promise is a thenable object, so I can ask the promise to invoke a then or even a catch. They use this other syntax, which is using two functions, two callback functions inside of the same then, but I would probably still use catch, and for a good reason, because when we look at async await, uh, you will see that it's very similar to this then and catch. Okay, then we've got tasks. And then we've got promises chaining, which was already something that you know, because I already told you. So as you can see here, they're creating a new promise that uses a function, a callback function that uses resolve and reject. And after a timeout of one second, it's going to resolve with the number one, not 42. And then now that we have the promise, as soon as we declare the promise and we press enter, the promise starts right away. As soon as you declare it, it will be invoked. So you can attach a then, and it's going to alert the result, but it's also going to return the result doubled for some reason. And if I return anything from a then method, this means that it's going to return a promise that resolves with this result times two. So now we can chain another then that given the result, and the result now is result times two, is going to alert the result, and then I can result again, uh, I can return again a result time two. And given this other result, I can alert that result and return again and again and again. It, there's no real need to do all this stuff, but it's just meant to show you how you can uh, chain promises one after the other with just a do this and then do that and then do that and then do that. As long as you return something this something that you're returning will automatically be wrapped inside of a promised and returned from this then method so you can chain another then or a catch or a finally. And that's it. This is how it works. New promise, resolve one, then return two, then return four, then blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can also use the variable promise if you really want to. So you can, you can also not use method chaining the hard way you can do uh, let's say the result of this promise into a variable then I'm doing promise then then I'm doing another promise then then I'm doing another promise then but I'm pretty sure that this is going to give us another result yep this is going to give me another result watch out this chain is going to give you a new promise for every single then that you have. So you create a promise with new promise, and then, after this then, you're creating a new promise, which will be chained and, in, and uh, have this then invoked that will generate a new promise. And here we've got a flow of information because we start with a promise that is holding the number one, and then the one is transformed into two, then it's going to be transformed into four, then it's going to be transformed into an eight. In this other case, we are actually chaining the then method to the same promise that we had in the first place. So in this first scenario, we've got a new promise that when results generates a new promise that generates a new promise that generates a new promise. 
In this case, instead, we are attaching all these thens to the same promise. So what we have graphically is this. We've got one promise that when resolved will trigger multiple thens. And this is very important. This is what makes the promise similar to the observer pattern because you've got one thing that is triggering an event and you've got multiple listeners who are interested in that event and they will be triggered, they will handle the event at the same time. So watch out, the way you write those promises makes a big difference. Uh, if you want to, you can return a new promise explicitly, but as uh, uh, we already saw, you can also not return the promise explicitly if you don't need to. In fact, here we are returning result times two, but what happens under the hood is that we are returning a new promise that returns immediately result times two. But if you, if you have to also add a set timeout, well, in that case, you have to wrap the set timeout inside of a new promise and resolve after the timeout has, uh, was, has been reached. Uh, the example will load scripts. You can chain those load scripts together. Load script one, then given that script, you load script two. Then with the script that you loaded, you load script three. And then once you've got all the scripts loaded, you can invoke any function that you want. For example, one, two, or three. And if uh, you have those simple functions that do only one thing and do it well, maybe you can turn them into arrow functions, which become very nice looking one-liners. And this is, yeah, <laughs> this looks cool and this does not. What is happening here? The thing that, are, that they are showing here is the wrong way of using promises. Uh, it's difficult to read, so I'm going to copy this code and I'm going to paste it here. And I'm also going to ch change the name of these load scripts. So what you see here is the use of promises, but the wrong way. It's the use of promises, but still using uh, callback hell. In fact, we are loading the script one, and then given the script one, inside of the callback function, we are loading the script two, and then inside of it, we're loading the script three, and then once loaded the script three, we can do one, two, and three. But this is not leveraging the power of promises. The cool thing about promises is that they can be chained. So instead of being invoked one inside of the other, they can be invoked one after the other. Because when I do then script one, this allows me to invoke, let, let's go to a new line. This allows me to invoke load script again, but load script is returning a promise. So instead of doing a then inside of this callback function, I can close the callback function and use the then right after, not inside. So this is how you refactor your code from uh, callback hell, no, this was uh, useful, uh, from callback hell into promise chaining. There's not, we don't have this thing here anymore. We just have this, load a script, then with the script that you have, load another script, then with the script that you have, load another script, then once you've got all the three scripts, you can do whatever you want. And usually there's some more indentation here, but uh, I think that if I remove it and Pritya is okay with that, Pritya will add it back again. It doesn't because we have syntax error here. Uh, I put those uh, three, uh, suspension marks, which makes no sense, of course. But if I, ooh, there's too much now. Yeah, okay, now we've got ESLint errors, but no syntax errors. So now the code was actually formatted. But I prefer to stick with the syntax errors. This way ESLint will not complain. Okay, so now we've got just method chaining. 
And yeah, this is the concept of Venables, which I think is too, too complicated. We don't really care about the concept of Venable. We just use promises. Then if you want to create your own Venable, then you can create a class with a constructor, with a then method, then blah, blah, blah. But who cares about that? You don't create your own Venables. You just create promises. That's it. Ooh, a bigger example, fetch. I like this example because this example is a real use case. So we're going to use it. I'm going to show you a cool website. It's called SWAPI. Swappy. I usually call Swappy. Swappy is the Star Wars API. And this is a website Oh, what happened to swappy.co? Now it's swappy.dev. What happened to swappy.co? Unfortunately, swappy.co is not maintained anymore and the service is currently down. This is a branch of swappy that will be supported going forward. Okay, so someone probably took care of the old website, which is not supported anymore, and we still have this. So what is this uh, Star Wars API? All the Star Wars data you've ever wanted. Planets, spaceships, vehicles, people, films and species. From all seven Star Wars films. Seven? Hmm. Now with the Force Awakens data. Yay! Try it now. So there is a, an address here, a URL. HTTPS swappy.dev slash API slash. And then you add another piece of it, like people slash one. When you add this and you perform the request, the result will be some JSON object that shows you the person with ID one in this API, which is Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker has a height of 172 centimeters, a mass of 77 kilograms. He's blonde. His skin color is fair. Okay, I would like to see if there's anybody who's got unfair skin color. His eye color is blue. His birth year is 19 BBY. Thank you for making this lesson, says the sluggish scout. Thank you for attending. Nice to see you. And the gender of Luke Skywalker is male. Oh my god, I'm going, I'm going to get moved. Ah, uh, His homeworld is planet number one. What is planet number one? I don't know, but we can check. We can say planets slash one. What does this give me? Ooh, Tatooine. Yes, Luke Skywalker comes from Tatooine, which has a rotation period of 23, orbital period of 3 or 4, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, as you can see, this is APIs, application programming interface, that can be used publicly by anyone, especially if you're a fan of the Star Wars franchise. You just need to invoke this thing here, https swappy.dev slash api slash planets slash one slash, for example. I can try to do this on my uh, browser address bar. Let's try again with people slash one. <clears throat> and what you see here is still a web page. It's a web page that shows you very badly, actually. <laughs> it shows you the response that you get from the server. We performed a GET request, whatever this means. I'm going to tell you about RESTful, um, RESTful APIs one day, don't worry. But we are performing a GET request on this URL. And what we received was an HTTP response of 200. 200 is a code that means everything is okay. And in fact, it also tells you it's okay. The type of the content is a JSON, uh, is JSON data. It's a JavaScript object. And we don't really care too much about these other things. And here we've got the JSON that was returned. Unfortunately, the links are all in white, so it's, they are not really easy to, to read. But who cares about that? One thing that I, however, want to tell you is that when you perform this request from the browser, you would see a web page. But if we perform this request from code, uh, we will not get the web page. We will just have the code or the headers 
and the body itself in plain JavaScript object, which is what we want because the machine doesn't care about this header with home about documentation. The machine, our code doesn't care about the tweet button. It just cares about the, uh, the results that we want. So let's try and fetch this uh, code, or this uh, object, programmatically from JavaScript. Ready? Hopefully it works. So I'm going to create a new file here called fetch. And I'm going to call it fetch because we're starting to use another construct that is part of the JavaScript language and it's called the fetch API. Fetch API means that we now have a function called fetch, which is provided by JavaScript. And fetch allows us to create requests to a server. To be precise, these are called Ajax requests, which is a very strange and even obsolete term. But Ajax requests are, well, requests to a server performed from a browser. Let's call them like this for now. And I can fetch a URL, I can fetch an address. The address was something like HTTPS, or H, whoa, HTTPS, colon slash slash, swappy dot dev, not co anymore, slash, and then what did we have? It was uh, API slash people slash one slash. This was the URL. Uh, of course, you can copy paste it from anywhere. If you want, I can even copy it to the, not the Discord, but you can join Discord. Please join Discord. It would be nice to see you there. To, to see you there. Okay. After almost four hours of, uh, of coding and speaking, I'm starting to lose my language abilities. Okay, so we've got fetch, given those API. I hope they work, so I'm going to try them too. Yep, they do. Okay. And fetch is a function that is automatically provided by the JavaScript language and it uses promises. So what we have here is a promise. The, pr the fetch function immediately returns something. And that something is a promise, which says, I don't know when I will be able to fetch, but I promise I'll try my best. I'm starting right away. And then we can ask the promise to do something as soon as this fetch operation was performed. So we can attach a then. The fetch API will return the response. And I can do this in an arrow function if I want to. I always showed you response with a couple of parentheses here. I also told you that those parentheses are optional, but when I'm using Prettier, Prettier prefers to add those parentheses. So we will keep those parentheses. Whenever I remove these parentheses, Prettier will always add them back again. What is the response? Well, the response is a special object that contains a lot of information. Uh, I don't even remember how much information we have here. I think that there is a OK property which is a boolean that tells you if the response went well or not. So this works pretty well if you want to put it in an if else. Uh, if the response is okay, then continue. Otherwise, throw an error, for example. Hmm? And okay is just a derived property from the, probably from the status. Status is a number. And we've got many status codes. You probably know about 404, which stands for not found. And we also have other status codes. For now, we just care about 200, which means all right, everything is okay. And yeah, we can think about 404. There's also all the class of uh, statuses like 500, which means the server got an error. The 400 statuses usually mean that you, the client, made an error. And that's it, we don't really care too much about those. So the response has multiple things. It has an OK, which is a Boolean. We can just console log it if we want to. Console log response OK, which should be true. We can console log the status, 
which should be 200. I'm going to say, I'm going to put some comments here. Status should be 200. And then console log should give us also the headers if we want to. What are the headers? Well, the headers are those meta information that we saw in here. This thing here, content type, application JSON, very accept, allow get head options. I think that also this 200 OK is part of the headers and we'll see. We will see what we will we'll have. Uh, you know what, for now we can just have a look at those. So I'm going to copy this code and paste it on the developer tools, okay? Okay, opening the developer tools on the browser. Let's see what happens. Okay, the promise was pending, but almost instantaneously it is now fulfilled. The result is undefined for some reason, but I see, okay, yes, of course it is undefined because we are not returning anything from the then. The promise that we see here is not the promise that we declared, is the result of invoking then, right? So the promise is fulfilled and the result is undefined because we just console log a bunch of things and nothing else. And what we see logged in the console is true because the response was okay, 200 because the response status is the number 200. And as for the response headers, apparently it's an object of class headers. It's an object of type headers. Oh, and it doesn't contain anything at all. Okay. Who cares? <laughs> and what about the body? The body is the most important part. I want to see this JSON. So this is how we deal with this kind of uh, API. And it's also the reason why I don't like the Fetch API and I try to never use the Fetch API. Instead, I use a library called Axios. So, small tip, Anthony prefers using Axios.js instead of Fetch API. My personal choice, not only mine, I know a lot of people who highly prefer using libraries instead of just the Fetch native API. But if you don't know how to install a library, if you don't care, if you don't bother about using a library, just use the Fetch API, they work. We have three different ways of fetching data from the internet in JavaScript. There was a very old thing called something like, was it XML, XML HTTP request? It was an object called like this, I think. Let me check. Yep, XML HTTP request, but I got the name wrong because XML for some reason is all uppercase and HTTP is not. This is a very old way that we used to create those requests to the server. And uh, probably internally, it is still used by JavaScript itself or by some libraries, but nowadays we never use it uh, directly because it's 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 crap it's really badly designed it's it's badly designed because it uses this word xml which has nothing to do with what we are doing we are not using xml we are using json xml is old uh, style code and we're never going to use xml hopefully and then we've got http HTTP is the protocol, the internet protocol on which, on top of which we are performing all these requests. And it's an acronym. It means Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And it's an acronym just like XML. Because this means Extendable Markup Language. So if it's an acronym, why is it not all uppercase? <laughs> why is it like this? And also XML HTTP request has a very complex API. It's very difficult to, to perform a simple request. As you can see with the fetch, you can just do fetch and you fetch things. But with XML HTTP request, it's a whole lot of things that you have to do. And this is one way that you can perform requests. Um, there was another way. Oh my God, now I don't remember it. Uh, there was this one and then what else? We've got the fetch API, we've got libraries. 
Okay, I think I got it wrong. Maybe there was just this one. And then we've got the fetch API. I don't know. Ajax in JavaScript. This is the story. The story of JavaScript. Okay, this is the XML HTTP request. Was there anything else that we could do? No, probably not. The request, the response. No, no, no. That was the only way. Now we've got the fetch API. And before the fetch API, we used to use jQuery as a library a lot. And jQuery allowed first to do something like this, dollar dot, uh, what was that? Dollar dot uh, JSON or dollar dot get. I don't even remember the API, but you had a URL here. And uh, jQuery at first allowed for a callback function in case of success that gave you the response and it also allowed for a callback function in case of error something like this we used to use a lot uh, doing ajax request this way then jquery in started introducing a concept similar to promises so it was more like uh, const promise is equal to dollar get the url itself and then promise dot done because jQuery used this uh, non-standard way of dealing with uh, with asynchronous requests. So this was the way we did it. Now we've got the fetch API, and uh, it looks very similar because we are dealing with promises. So we don't really care too much about jQuery. In fact, there's a whole website that tells you you might not need jQuery. It's a website that tells you that jQuery is now pretty obsolete and a lot of things that you were doing in the past with jQuery. Oh, here it is. Dollar get JSON. It was not just get, sorry. It was get JSON, given a URL and a callback function. Now you can do it in Internet Explorer starting from 10 onwards. You can use the XML HTTP request, which is huge. It's ugly especially compared to this uh, one line of code. But you can also use other things like, um, let me see. No, they, did, they don't even show you. Well, you can use the Fetch API nowadays. So you don't need to use the XML HTTP request anymore if you don't target Internet Explorer. So yeah, jQuery is now obsolete. We're not going to use it. We're going to use the Fetch API, which is already promise-based. So Fetch is returning a promise and then we can ask the promise to do something with the response. What I don't like about the fetch API, one of the things that I don't like about the fetch API is that the body of the response is not immediately available to you. In fact, the response has a couple of methods here that you can use. One is called text and text is a method that takes the body of the response and parses it as plain text, which is not our case. In fact, this is not plain text and we don't want to process it as plain text. We want to process it as a JavaScript object because then we want to do something with this object. Maybe we want to uh, inspect the name of this object or calculate the mass uh, in another, on another planet or something like that. So we don't want text and that's why we also have another method that we can use and it's called JSON. Response.json is going to take the body from the response, which is just a stream of bytes coming from the server, and it's going to process it and return the body as a JSON object. So I would be tempted to say, hey, the body now is the result of response.json. But the problem is that fetch, the fetch API, do not return the body. They return a, a promise that will resolve with the body. So response.json is not giving me the body. It's going to give me a promise. And since we can chain things together, I can just return the JSON that comes from the response and I can append another then and enqueue this then that will have the body available to me as the final results. I can do a console log of that body and see what happens. 
And this is what we're going to do. As, of course, as always, with method chaining, we don't even need to declare this variable promise. So I can just fetch and then with the response, I'm doing things. And then with the body of that thing, I'm going to console log the body. So this is what we're going to do. Let's see how it works. Again, since I'm too fast, I know I'm too fast, I'm sorry. Angelo is very silent today. I hope you're not giving up on me. Uh, Angelo sometimes uh, is telling me that I go too fast. And he's right, he's completely right. Sometimes for the, I'm so frantic to prove a point that I forget that maybe some of you are trying to code along with me. So, sorry for that. That's why sometimes I stop, slow down, and repeat the code that I'm uh, looking at. So, to give you guys the time to uh, code along. So, fetch is fetching data, but this is returning a promise. Instead of storing that promise in a variable, I'm just going to do a then on the result of fetch. Then accepts something that is usually called a response. The response has multiple properties that I can uh, just uh, console log. So the OK, which is a Boolean, true, false. Status, 200, and if it's 200, it's definitely OK. And the headers, which we saw, it seems like an object, but it was an empty one. So we, don't, we didn't really care too much about that. And then, in order to get access to the real body of the response, I also have to invoke this method response.json. But response.json is an asynchronous method, which instead of returning the body, the parsed body, it's going to return the promise that will resolve into the body. So I can just return the promise as it is, and this way I can chain another then to this chain of, uh, uh, to the stream of invocations. And now I assume that I have the body available, so I can just console log the body and see what happens, okay? I'm going to enter, and this thing solves almost immediately. As you can see, I got a promise which was which is was pending, but then it was fulfilled almost immediately. And then we've got the console log of true, the console log of 200, the console log of the headers, which is empty. And finally, we've got also the body. And as you can see, it's inspectable. It's a JavaScript object and I can do things with it. For example, here I have references to other URLs, other addresses that I can uh, inspect. So apparently Luke Skywalker was available on film one, two and three, which are episodes four, five and six, of course, and also on film six, which is The Force Awakens. I don't understand why they say that they are just seven films. Maybe they want to ignore the last trilogy. But isn't The Force Awaken part of the last trilogy? So they should be probably nine. Or maybe they could also add the, um, the other ones, like Solo and, well, the best, ones all, uh, the best one of all. What was that? Rogue One? Rogue One? Yeah, Rogue One, probably. So I don't know these, why they say seven. There should be more than seven. But maybe this is uh, too, too old. So as you can see, the fetch API is actually pretty easy. You just fetch, it returns a promise, so you can then on that promise and you get a response. Then you have to remember to also uh, return the promise uh, that is the result of response.json. And then finally you can do another then which holds the body. What happens if I say response.text? This should give me the body as plain text. I don't know if it works. Let's try it. Yep, as you can see, this is not inspectable. This is just a string of code. It's just a string. Of course, I can also do a JSON parse and probably this will work. Uh, maybe I can do a json.parse of body. What happens if I do this? Yeah, now I still have the object, but why should I do the JSON parse by myself? I can leave it to uh, the fetch API just by using response.json, okay? 
So yeah, I'll leave it like this. Response.json, just parse the response as if it was a JSON object, and then I can process the element itself as it is. What else, what else, what else? Um, the fetch API, well, one thing that I don't like about the fetch API is that I have to do this two steps. While other libraries such as, while libraries such as Axios do not even need these two steps. When you fetch elements from an external server with Axios, you have all the headers of the response already available, plus Axios understands that the response body is, should be JSON, so it parses the JSON immediately, and you need to do only one then instead of two. So that's why one reason why I prefer Axios. And I think that jQuery did the same thing. You didn't need to parse the, the, the body of the response with jQuery. So I don't know what happens with the JavaScript guys sometimes. Sometimes they design beautiful things. Sometimes what they design is a little buggy and sloppy. And I think that the Fetch API is quite sloppy. I don't like the Fetch API uh, for this reason, but also for another reason. Because when you want to perform requests on the server, sometimes you want to perform requests to fetch data from the server, but sometimes you want to send data to that server, right? In that case, what is the API that you should use? Well, it's still fetch. Even if you're not fetching anything, even if you're sending data to the server, you're still using the word fetch, which is kind of stupid. Instead, a library like Axios allows you to do axios.get if you want to get things from the server and post if you want to post things to the server and it has a method for every HTTP method available get, post, put, patch, delete, options, head, etc. etc. All methods that some, some of the methods you already know, some of them you don't know but you can have a glimpse at them in here. You get a get, head, options, blah, blah, blah. Don't remove the comma from here. Uh, okay. I think we can stop here because there's al already a lot. I just want to make sure that we have um, seen pretty much everything, at least from this page. So you will be able to do the tasks on promises. And apparently, yes. So the topic is not over. We can have a look at error handling. We can have a look at, well, rethrowing, etc., etc. Maybe that's even too much. Uh, then we can have a look at some cool methods that belong to promises, like the all method that allows you to um, spawn multiple asynchronous requests at the same time and collect the results. So this will give you more performance because you're not forced to do one request at a time. You can do all of them at the same time in parallel. And there's also other cool methods there, uh, race, any, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then after this, I think that we will go to the async await. Not even promiseification is something that we already saw. Okay, there's a lot of stuff. Maybe we don't, we will not do all of this, but we'll definitely look at async await next Saturday. So uh, let's do some practice on this. Let's practice a little bit of classes, a little bit of error, hen error handling and a little bit of promises. And then we will have a look at those exercises next Wednesday. Remember, the exercises that I'm talking about are exactly the tasks that you have at the end of each one of these tutorials. Well, those who provide tasks, these are usually very well done. Uh, maybe I can come up with uh, some homework that I will share with you next Wednesday if I come up with something. Or you can go to Free Code Camp or other tutorials that you can find by yourself. In the meantime, remember to eat pasta and code faster. So, bye! See you next Wednesday for the next practice and next Saturday for the next lesson. Ciao!